Good morning and welcome to the FTC's second session of our hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. My name is Suzanne Monk and I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Policy Planning. And on behalf of the FTC and all of my colleagues, I'd like to welcome everyone who is joining our session in person and via webcast. And I'd like to give my special thanks and gratitude to our tremendous panels that we will have today, including Nobel laureate Professor Joseph Stieglitz, who is one of the probably most esteemed critics of approaches to antitrust in, modern, in the modern economy, and also our former chairman and former commissioner, William Kovacic. So thank you very much to everyone who is participating today. We're very grateful for your time. Before we get started, it is my job to run through a few housekeeping announcements. First, if you have your mobile phone with you, please silence it today. We're very grateful for that. Second, if you leave the Constitution Center today for any reason, you'll have to go back through the security screening again. So please keep that in mind as you're scheduling the time for coffee, et cetera. Most of you have received a lanyard with the FTC event security badge. We recycle those, so if you wouldn't mind giving that back at the end of the day, we'd be very grateful. If there's an emergency that occurs that requires you to leave the Constitution Center but remain in the building, follow the instructions provided over the PA. If you have to evacuate the building, an alarm will sound. Everyone should leave the building in an orderly manner through the main 7th Street exit. That's where you entered. After leaving the building, turn left and proceed down 7th Street and across E to the FTC emergency assembly area. You can also just look for me or any other FTC staff and we will make sure to guide you in the right direction. If you notice any suspicious activity today, please alert security and please be advised that the event is photographed, webcast and recorded. By participating in this event, you are agreeing that your image and anything you say or submit may be posted indefinitely at ftc.gov or on one of the commission's publicly available social media sites. Restrooms are located in the hallway just around the corner. If you need anything, please ask any of the FTC staff. We're happy to help you. And we have a cafeteria on site that closes at 3 p.m. So with that housekeeping, it is now my tremendous pleasure to introduce Commissioner Kelly Slaughter and to hear from the panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you to all of you. It's so nice to be here today. I am pleased and privileged to be opening our second day of hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. I have long been interested in how policymakers tackle complicated questions about the challenges and opportunities posed by new technologies. In fact, as an anthropology major, I wrote my college thesis on the first set of congressional hearings on genetic engineering in the early 1980s. I conducted a detailed and sophisticated analysis of the language that members and witnesses used in those hearings and reached a staggering conclusion. Everyone came into that exercise with their minds made up. As an anthropology student who had no experience in government at the time, I was shocked by this conclusion. But now, with the benefit of a decade of experience working in Congress under my belt, my insightful deduction feels more like a statement of the staggeringly obvious. I bring up this story because the hearings we are now convening have a similar backdrop to those genetic engineering hearings in the early 80s. Technological innovation has raised serious and important questions of law and policy. And I can understand why those familiar with the ways of Washington might be suspicious that there is a predetermined outcome or a desire to simply endorse the status quo. However, I believe this moment is different. These hearings are not a project of reaffirming our current policies and practices. To the contrary, they must be a critical rethink of what we do, how we do it, 
and what we should do differently or better to advance the FTC's mission of protecting consumers and promoting competition. If at the end of the day, we appear to be merely patting ourselves on the back for a job well done thus far, we will have failed. This is an extremely exciting moment to be at the FTC. Technological innovation is not only affecting our traditional work in both competition and consumer protection, it is blurring the line between our two traditionally distinct missions. As we heard on the first day of these hearings, there is substantial evidence that markets and sectors are becoming increasingly concentrated across the economy. At the same time, they are becoming increasingly technologically dependent. Technology is no longer simply an industry. It is a part of every industry. As a result, it is relevant in more and more matters before the Commission. Privacy and data security might come to mind first, but consumer protection staff also grapple with the implications of technology when tackling cryptocurrencies, online marketing, data throttling, tech support scams, fintech, and even robocalls. On the competition side, we have also long had to keep pace with technological advancement. We are seeing more and more mergers and conduct matters with technology-related issues such as data collection, intellectual property, and network effects. And as consumers become data commodities themselves, the nature of competition has been evolving as well. What is even more interesting to me is how these questions about competition and consumer protection no longer happen in isolation. Addressing a legal question on one side often has profound implications for the other. Consider a hypothetical merger between two companies which each control substantial consumer data. What are the privacy and security implications of that roll-up? Consider also the consequences for consumers when limited competition means there is no meaningful choice about whether to patronize a company that may not prioritize user privacy. Policy changes on the consumer protection side have competition implications as well. How could effective data portability help facilitate entry and competition while sufficiently protecting privacy? Will new privacy regulations have the unintended consequence of stifling innovation and entrenching incumbents? The FTC is uniquely well positioned to tackle these issues with thoughtful attention to their interplay. Many other jurisdictions have completely separate agencies to address privacy, consumer protection, and competition missions. The FTC is somewhat anomalous by having these issue sets housed under our single umbrella. It is incumbent on us to take advantage of our structure and our expertise to meet this economic moment. In other ways, perhaps, we can learn from the contrast with other jurisdictions. First, the passage and implementation of GDPR across the pond, as well as the CCPA closer to home, provide excellent natural experiments for us to see how long-standing ideas like the right to be forgotten work in practice. We can also monitor implementation for unintended consequences, including for competition. At the same time, the European Commission is pursuing high-profile competition cases that involve American companies. Of course, they are working with an entirely different set of laws with respect to competition. The abuse of dominant standard, which does not exist in our statutory framework, puts specific burdens on firms that reach a certain market share. As we observe the European cases and practices in practice, we have an opportunity to consider the benefits or risks of changing our statutory standards here. I hope that these hearings generally, and today's panel specifically, give us a chance to analyze these issues carefully. Chairman Simons noted in his introduction last week that he has an open mind as to what conclusions will be drawn for the hearings, as do I. This is not, to me, like those genetic engineerings I analyzed back in college. I do not approach this with the conclusions pre-inscribed. This critical self-examination should not lead to a reaffirmation of everything we are already doing. Reflection premised on changing conditions will inevitably uncover areas that are ripe for improvement. It is simply not plausible that a meaningful self-examination will lead to the conclusion that nothing should change. I am very open-minded as to what that change should be in terms of substance and magnitude. I also think it is important to consider what should change operationally at the FTC and what should be changed by Congress. Those inquiries are not mutually exclusive. We can both do better with our current toolbox and identify areas where we need to supplement it with additional authority or additional resources. My mother teases me frequently with the adage, change is hard. It's funny because it's true, 
And I think it's particularly true, not only for me personally, but also for many of us across the legal profession who are raised with the idea that doctrine is developed carefully and thoughtfully over time. Even though change is hard, it can also be good. Healthy democratic institutions can comfortably acknowledge areas of weakness or prior errors and improve. We can think carefully and also radically at the same time. We must hear and consider new ideas and new voices and not be wed to the notion that the status quo is any more justified than a departure from it. Thinking both carefully and radically is nothing new for our first speaker today, whom I have the honor of introducing. Joseph E. Stiglitz is an extraordinarily accomplished economist who has been at the forefront of major economic policy issues for the past 40 years. His work and achievements are vast, so I will attempt to give you just the highlights. Professor Stiglitz currently teaches at Columbia University, and he is co-chair of the High-Level Expert Group on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress at the OECD. That is a mouthful. He is also the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. His career has included stints in leadership at the World Bank, the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and the Initiative for Policy Dialogue. Professor Stiglitz may be best known for his innovative work to create a new branch of economics, the economics of information, and for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information. He has received almost innumerable prizes and accolades, including the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. And perhaps most notably, his son once worked for me as a law clerk. Thank you to Professor Stiglitz and to everyone who is participating in the FTC's examination of competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. I also want to thank the FTC staff for their tireless work in planning and carrying out these hearings, and I look forward to lively discussions today. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and, 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 at, at, at this time where, where the issues that we're talking about are so much up in the air. Uh, I was, had the good fortune to participate uh, in a similar convening uh, 23 years ago uh, in, in 1995 when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, at that time, uh, the broad consensus in the Council was that America had uh, a monopoly problem. Uh, we were also concerned, uh, we and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, with which we work closely, were very concerned that uh, this market power problem was going to have and was having an adverse effect on innovation. Uh, those concerns that I felt then, uh, I think, have been multiplied in the intervening almost 25 years uh, enormously. So what I want to do today is to try to describe uh, the ways, in, uh, the reasons that I think uh, the time is ripe, really, for a rethinking uh, of uh, competition policy. Uh, we have a market problem, uh, it's both a, mon uh, a market power problem, it's both a monopoly and a monopsony problem. And I think in the past we haven't focused enough on the issues of monopsony. Uh, it's evident, it seems to me, that current antitrust and competition laws as they are enforced and have been interpreted are not up to the task of ensuring a competitive marketplace. The point is that if if our standard competitive analysis tools don't show that there is a problem, it suggests something may be wrong with the tools themselves. Many changes have occurred in our understanding of economics, in the structure of the economy, and there have been uh, innovations in anti-competitive practices. Uh, our, our, uh, it may be that, that the innovation isn't showing up in GDP, but it's showing up in market power. And uh, competition law, I think, has not kept up. Much of the current presumptions uh, uh, and law has been influenced by what is sometimes called the Chicago School. I don't want to blame just Chicago, and not everybody in Chicago uh, uh, has flawed views. So uh, it's just a, a term of art uh, and not meant to, uh, uh, not meant to, to target a particular location. Um, what I'm really referring when I say to Chicago School is just the competitive equilibrium model. And that model, which has informed our thinking, uh, 
is basically not robust, as I'll explain, and it does not provide a good, uh, good description of the economy. And the legal framework based on that as the underlying model will not serve the purpose of ensuring a competitive marketplace. Uh, it won't do that very well. Having an inadequate competition framework has broad economic and political consequences. In other words, having an economy that's rife with market power uh, means that we have a less efficient economy. It reduces opportunity as a result of important barriers to entry. It creates an unlevel playing field. Market power can lead to growth not based on efficiencies. The example that everyone knows about is the lower cost of capital of large banks as a result of implicit too big fail guarantees may allow result in big banks uh, expanding not because of economies of scale or scope, but simply because of the implicit guarantee of government. There are political consequences. The concentration of economic powers translated into political, uh, into politics, undermining our democracy. And a broad sense of powerlessness uh, in society leads to a view that the system is rigged and unfair, and that too has political consequences. These, of course, were some of the original concerns of antitrust law. Uh, and I'm, I think the focus has been unnecessarily uh, narrowed. But I want to emphasize that my talk today is really on the economics. Uh, if we get the economics right, we'll have broader political uh, 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 benefits. Uh, but I think we've really gotten the narrow economics very badly wrong. The failures of competition show up at the macroeconomic level. Uh, growing uh, inequality, uh, uh, lower investment, uh, decreasing entry of gro and growth of small businesses. I, I, I want to emphasize uh, lack of competition is not the only source of these problems, but I believe it's an important contributor uh, to many of these trends. Uh, there's been a, a, just a, a, a rethinking of the, uh, of the consequences of these, uh, 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 of the, of, of, uh, these inefficiencies. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, Al Harberger's work talked about uh, the uh, triangles, the Harberger triangles, the inefficiencies associated with them being relatively small compared to the macroeconomic consequences and insufficiency of aggregate demand. But there are new studies by Fari uh, and his co-authors at Harvard, which show that the uh, loss of GDP, of national output, as a result of uh, market power, of the markups of price over marginal costs that would not exist in a competitive marketplace, are orders of magnitude larger and today are uh, very, very significant. From the perspective of economic theory, uh, we know that the efficiency of market economy is based on individuals and firms facing the same price. That's the way everybody has the same marginal cost, marginal benefits. But the pervasive price discrimination that big data the new technologies that were referred to uh, uh, just a minute ago by the commissioner uh, undermines the fundamental theorem of welfare economics. And except in the limiting case of perfect discrimination, uh, the attempt to extract more consumers or producer surplus distorts uh, the economy. It was one of the points that I made in one of my earlier articles uh, on uh, price discrimination uh, uh, in the presence of imperfect information. And then turning to what most of us think is in the long run is really important, innovation, uh, it is also clear that uh, market power can have a very negative effect on innovation. And I'll have a few minutes uh, to talk about uh, why the Schumpeterian model, as it's conventionally understood, uh, doesn't provide, a, again, a good description. Um, but the, the basic idea uh, that, that uh, uh, what are the conditions under which uh, market economies are more innovative are ideas that I've explored in my book, Creating a Learning Society, in which I've shown that uh, increase in market power can have a very negative effect on, on innovation. Well, the lack of competition uh, 
in many sectors is evident in the limited range of choices. You probably already talked about that in your previous uh, 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 discussions. Um, in many cases, lack of competition has to be assessed at the local level. Small businesses in many locales have, had only, have only one or two providers of loans. Uh, the FTC has done important work in the area of hospitals, which are all obviously local. And my referring to that is important because while uh, we're going to be talking a lot about lack of competition in new sectors like, like technology, we shouldn't forget that there's lack of competition in a lot of the old sectors as well. And that uh, our, our antitrust standards have not worked, uh, not only for the new areas, but also for the, also for the old ones. Often the lack of choice uh, is hidden, and uh, as I say, it's pervasive around, uh, 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 throughout the economy. Uh, you think you're going to different drugstores with different labels, but of course they're all owned by the same company, buying different beers, but they're all owned by a couple of companies. So, uh, and, and as you start looking through various parts of the economy, it's not only the big things, uh, it's also the little things like dog foods and batteries and, uh, and, and coffins. Um, so, um, there's a broader evidence of uh, increases in market power, data on increased concentration across a wide range of sectors, increased markup in many sectors, uh, typically linked to increased concentration, some interesting econometric work that solves the identification problem that plagued people in earlier uh, uh, days. Um, in many sectors, the pervasive uh, price discrimination, as I say, which is actually counter to the basic argument that we use for what makes uh, for a, a good economy. There's an increased share of rents. Um, the share of labor has been going down. That's been getting a lot of attention. But so has the share of capital when you appropriately measure. You can look at the accumulated value of investment, both in fiscal capital, but also in tangibles. And if you uh, impute an uh, appropriate risk-adjusted rate of return, uh, the uh, share of capital is going down. Well, what does that mean? If the share of labor is going down, the share of capital is going down, uh, the shares have to add up to one. That's one thing economists can agree on. And uh, the residual is what we call rents, and some of that is increased land rents, but a lot of it has to do with increased market power profits. And uh, that is affecting uh, 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 the efficiency of the economy, but also the distribution. Uh, it has um, negative uh, macroeconomic consequences. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, investment is lower than it should be. The downward sloping demand curves result in the marginal return to investment being lower than the average return, and this is consistent with investment being weak even as profit shares increase. And there are studies that look cross-section and relate the two and show that this is not only a, uh, an observation we can make on basis of time series data, but also cross-section data. Uh, the constructed barriers to entry discourage entry and innovation, remarkably little entry in some very highly profitable sectors. Even though there have been high levels of innovation in sectors that are, uh, you might call neighboring, where, where the same kinds of technology uh, would seem to be uh, relevant. Of course, we know that uh, firms have strong incentives to engage in anti-competitive behavior in the absence of uh, government constraints. So we shouldn't be surprised. Anybody who believes in economics believes in incentives. And you look at uh, what are uh, the incentives, they are incentives to uh, behave in an anti-competitive way. Uh, I joke that uh, in our business school, uh, we teach our students how to be anti-competitive. I mean, our, we focus on how to create barriers to entry. And we have some really good students who, who go out there and, and do that. Of course, that means the economics department then has more business because we fight those barriers to entry that the business school uh, helps create. Um, but this long-standing presumption dates back to Adam Smith. All of you know people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. It's interesting that many people who think of Smith as the father of modern economics and 
the defender of the competitive model, he didn't believe that markets would be competitive on their own. He knew that they would go, they, that, that, uh, that there would be uh, anti-competitive actions. And in some ways, uh, it's quite striking. He anticipated, for instance, the uh, conspiracy of uh, Apple and others in the Silicon Valley to uh, suppress wages. Uh, masters are always and everywhere in a sort of tacit but constant and uniform combination not to raise the wages of labor above the actual rate. Uh, enter into particular combinations to sink the wages of labor even below this rate. They are always conducted with the utmost silence and secrecy. Uh, he couldn't have said it uh, better uh, describing what's <laughs> happened. And our business leaders really understand this. Peter Thiel uh, said competition is for losers. Uh, Warren Buffett uh, 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 said the single most important decision in evaluating business is pricing power. Uh, and uh, he d described, uh, in a way, uh, the economics. Uh, we think in terms of uh, 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 an entry barrier like being surrounded by a moat and uh, the ability to keep it with an uh, impossibility being crossed. We tell our managers we want the moat widened every year. So it's very clear that they understand the importance of uh, uh, making sure that markets are not competitive, and they've learned how to do that. I want to spend now a few minutes on uh, why there's been this growth in market power, and then I'm going to try to talk about what are the new understandings that we have in economics uh, about why the competitive model, that was the paradigm in the background, uh, is wrong. And then I'm going to talk about why these two things, the new, uh, the changes in the economy and our new understandings should lead to new presumptions, uh, uh, a new basis of antitrust policy. So there are multiple forces underlying the growth in market power. Uh, there are changes in structure demand towards local services in which competition may be limited. Uh, there are changes in technology. You've mentioned uh, the network platform economies, eco industries with large upfront costs and big data. Sometimes, though, there is a, uh, a, a fatalistic uh, view when you say, well, it's, it's these market forces, we just have to accept it. And I think that's wrong. To maintain competitive marketplace and in the presence of these changes will require more active competition policies with new tools and presumptions. Um, the point is that when you're dealing with uh, assessing the consequences of a merger, vertical or horizontal, uh, in the presence of an economy in which competition is limited, the consequences are markedly different than in an environment in which the economy is very close to perfectly competitive. So in, in fact, the underlying model that we need to use uh, has to be one that recognizes uh, these underlying changes going on in our economy. So while there are these, these uh, technological changes and demand changes, I think one has to also recognize that there has been enormous innovation by the business community in extending and amplifying market power. Uh, big data uh, has allowed the exploitation and pr price discrimination. There are innovative contracts with restraints, uh, bundling and nonlinear pricing. Uh, these are ideas that 50, 60 years ago we're not in the toolkit of the typical business person. But now, you go through a, a good business school, you'll learn all the tools that allow you to uh, uh, ma amplify and extend your market power. There are preemptive mergers, there are techniques in extending patent and life, um, pay for delay. Uh, when you see what has gone on, you have to admire the cleverness uh, you know, there's a lot of innovations. I wish it were directed to increasing the productivity of our economy rather than creating uh, entry barriers, but uh, it does demonstrate that somewhere in our education system we have uh, 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 led to creativity, not necessarily for uh, social good, though. These are the changes in the economy, but there are also major changes in our understandings of economics. 
most importantly, there's a greater understanding of the limitations of the competitive equilibrium model that really was the workhorse model, uh, the, the fundamental paradigm that was taught 50 years ago. Uh, the model is not robust. Well, when economists say the model is not robust, that means slight changes in the assumptions destroy the, con the conclusions. Uh, collusion about the efficiency of the market, the conclusions about the presence of market power. So, for instance, uh, information economics showed that even very small asymmetries of information totally changed the nature of the market equilibrium that emerged. Um, game theory uh, has perhaps had the greatest uh, impact. Um, uh, the fact that in uh, so many sectors of our economy, there are a limited number of, of players. Uh, again, 50 years ago, we didn't have the tools to analyze those kinds of situations. Now we have rigorous tools to analyze uh, uh, those situations. Uh, behavioral economics has uh, resulted in our, again, understanding the way markets work is markedly different than the competitive equilibrium model. Uh, in uh, standard economics, giving a discount or charging a price is exactly the same. Uh, it's the relative price. But in practice, those two can have very different effects. And the businesses know that. That's why they put constraints. They say you could do one thing and not the other. Standard theory said, well, why would you ever do that? They're equivalent. But they're not equivalent. Uh, they understand the nature of behavior and unfortunately, our legal framework hasn't caught up. So there are a whole set of, of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, presumptions that were based on that old model, and they, don't, they no longer uh, hold. The irony is that the critique of the standard competitive model was in full force just as the model's influence expanded. So when, at the time, Bork was writing and others were writing, um, we were already understood that that model was not a good model. But the legal uh, profession didn't, uh, there, was, there was a lag, uh, or perhaps uh, the important role of ideology. The, um, oh. uh, there are some other aspects of the new understandings that I, I want to just mention very briefly. Um, uh, it shows that the, 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 once we recognize the pervasiveness of market power and that even small market power in multiple industries can ap add up to having very large effects, very different from Harberger's perspective. Uh, uh, and that the market power and market imperfections can be generated in multiple ways. Uh, I already mentioned asymmetries of information. Search costs, the work of Peter Diamond showed that even small search costs can lead to large market power, even to monopoly situations. Uh, my own work showed that even small sunk costs can lead to large market power, undermining what was called the contestability doctrine. And once you have this market power, the market power can be amplified and extended in multiple ways. Uh, and we now know that there are serious problems of monopsony and uh, 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 especially in the labor market. Uh, I want to turn uh, to a minute on the dynamics because obviously innovation is important. Uh, we've learned uh, three things. I, uh, one, potential competition is not a substitute for real competition. And the second is the Schumpeterian doctrines that monopolies are only temporary competition to be the monopolist drives innovation are also not robust. Uh, monopolies can and have incentive, have the ability to stifle innovation. Uh, and that means the competition policy needs to focus not just on the effects of competition today, but on competition uh, in the future. So the bottom line of all of this is the, these changes in uh, the way our economy functions, uh, changes in our understandings of the economy, require new presumptions, new criterion tools, new remedies. One way to think about this is within a Bayesian framework, uh, 
uh, if we have strong beliefs about the way the economy behaves, we will build those uh, uh, priors into what evidence we require to come to whatever conclusion that we come to. Uh, but the law over the last uh, several decades has been influenced by presumptions of a competitive equilibrium model, which is not a good description of many sectors in the economy, and I think of the economy as a whole. And that means we have to rethink uh, the presumptions. We ought to be thinking more about new uh, rulemaking, new regulations, uh, 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 certain kinds of uh, practices uh, should be forbidden in the context where, uh, uh, say, there's large amounts of market power uh, with a strong <coughs> burden placed on those who are engaging in those practices to show that perhaps there's an efficiency defense. So uh, what we've seen is that over the last uh, several decades, uh, rampant abuse of the efficiency defense for the restraints uh, and the two-sided market uh, argument that's been used, for instance, in the American Express case is, is, uh, and, and in the master visa is, is an example. Uh, the presence of significant externalities is not even established. No attempt to show that observed pricing patterns are those predicted by the theory. Uh, no attempt at incidence theory. Pretend that price imposed a mer merchant is not shifted to consumers as it would be in the case in any competitive model. There's a kind of intellectual incoherence in a lot of the argumentation. Um, no attempt to, uh, uh, to analyze the impact on restraints of cross-platform competition, that there are horizontal effects of vertical constraints. That's one of the basic insights of modern uh, uh, recent research in, in, in uh, industrial organization. Well, let me talk a little bit about some of the uh, new presumptions that I would put forward. I think there should be a presumption against predation. Uh, I think, uh, the presumption against uh, uh, intervening in vertical mergers needs to be changed. A vertical mer mer merger can uh, have a very big effect on uh, the competitive landscape. The consumer welfare standard, uh, I think, is misguided, especially with monopsony and when long-run dynamics are important. Uh, even if a firm with monopsony power passes on some of the gains to consumers, there is a distortion in the economy and societal welfare is lowered. Predation may lower prices in the short run, but reduced competition will hurt in the long run. Uh, at the same point, uh, 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 there needs to be new approaches to determining market power. Some of these changes have already been going on for some time, and what worries me now is that there could be backsliding by the courts. So uh, historically, um, there was always a focus on market share as, a, as an indicator of market power. But there are many cases where you can ascertain market power uh, directly, and when you can, you should. Uh, is there evidence of pricing power or power to force buyers to accept contract provisions that are prima facie not in their interest? Um, large markups should be a prima facie evidence of market power. Uh, usurious interest rates by banks are an example. Uh, price discrimination, if it pays to sell to some firms at a low price, then selling to another at a high price should be a prima facie evidence of market power unless the defendant can show that there are justified by cost differences. And forcing buyers to accept terms that should be unacceptable like arbitration clauses. Um, so consumer protection needs to be extended to transparency of contract, and this echoes the remark that was made in the beginning, uh, that I increasingly there is a interplay between consumer protection and competition. Uh, there are other consider considerations that may reinforce the conclusion that a market uh, is, uh, a market is not uh, acting competitively, a market constraint is anti-competitive. For instance, persistent profits with no entry for an extended period of time is symptom, should be symptomatic that something was wrong. This leads one to the view that some of the simplifications of the past should not be viewed as acceptable. Uh, the, 
There are some instance cases where one can reliably ascertain incidents without ge full general analysis. The Illinois BRIC puts a constraint on anti -enfor uh, antitrust enforcement, and going beyond that would enable uh, one to uh, attack some obvious cases of anti-competitive behavior that have been left unaddressed. So this brings one to uh, a discussion of some new remedies just like there's been a lot of innovation in anti-competitive behavior, there needs to be innovation uh, in uh, remedies. Some of this, what I call innovation, is actually going back to standards, uh, practices that were held done in the past. Um, so uh, uh, one has to recognize that market power, once established, can persist. So there's a view that sometimes uh, had that we don't want to make a mistake and stifle uh, innovation, uh, stifle uh, a merger uh, that uh, might be uh, good for the economy. And so there is a lack of uh, the, 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 the type one and type two errors are balanced. But the point is that once you allow a monopoly power to get established, it persists and the effects can go on for decades. So these are not, the market is not self-correcting. The view that if we make a mistake, it's self-correcting is just wrong. There is long, large persistence. There is both theoretical and empirical evidence in support of that. Um, and we have to recognize that firms have incentive and ability to circumvent and innovate uh, to reestablish market power. And that means, for instance, there will have to be continued court oversight uh, that new natural monopolies and oligopolies need new policies. Just because market power arises from technology doesn't mean we should do nothing. Uh, it requires even more intense scrutiny of behavior, stronger policies to prevent the leveraging of market power. And among the kinds of policies are structural policies, breakups, prohibitions from going into downstream or upstream activities. Uh, my own view is typically the economies of scale and scope have been exaggerated and uh, seldom established. And also regulatory, po regulatory policies, uh, non-discrimination. Uh, I'm running out of time, uh, so let me uh, 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 go on to just mention uh, uh, just a couple more points. Um, uh, one is that we need stronger remedies. Um, some of this we can learn from abroad. Uh, as the commissioner was mentioning before, I think abusive market power, however acquired, should be illegal. And some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, issues that have gotten the most outrage, public outrage, are cases of that kind. Uh, and so the fact that our antitrust laws aren't able to deal with these kinds of abuses is really undermines confidence uh, in our uh, competition policies. Um, uh, we need to have uh, more active uh, consumer protection, prescribing arbitration clause, and strong transparency, net neutrality are examples. So there are a whole set of, uh, of issues of that kind. Lack of workers' bargaining power is a competition issue. Uh, I know that historically there's been a focus on, on product markets, but labor markets are markets. And there is a, 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 a lack uh, of uh, bargaining power. And once you go away from the competitive equilibrium model, you realize that there are restraints uh, that uh, affect the outcome uh, that result in, for instance, abusive working conditions. Uh, and uh, while, again, there are uh, forces uh, contributing to that, like globalization. I think competition authorities should articulate the consequences of trade agreements for competition, including for workers' uh, uh, bargaining power. I know you're going to be having separate uh, uh, hearings on big data and privacy. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, big data and privacy result are both consumer protection issues and competition issues, um, and uh, this big data uh, uh, can be a very big uh, entry barrier. Uh, it also enables uh, the extraction of consumer and producer surplus 
from consumers from the other side of the market. And what that means is that some of the profits are not a result of greater efficiencies, but greater ability to extract surplus. And that distorts the long run performance of the economy and it has large distributive consequences. There are some areas where uh, concentration of market power are especially problematic. And uh, one is in the marketplace of ideas in the media. And it's a mistake, I think, to view uh, uh, the media only as a mechanism for delivering advertising. Concentration of media in a few hands can reduce competition in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, I know that's going into a, a new area, but, but it, is, it seems to me uh, an important one for our society. So in conclusion, the time is ripe, I think, for a re-examination of our competition and consumer protection laws. Our economy has changed, and our understanding of economic, econo economics has changed. And we can better grasp the failures of the existing framework. The underlying political and economic concerns about power and exploitation that, that drove the original legislation are still present, perhaps even more so. But even if you looked at this uh, from a, an economic perspective, what is clear is that uh, competition law, as it's been interpreted over the last several decades, quarter century, uh, is not kept up with the changes changes in our economy, has not kept up with the innovations in uh, uh, the ability to ex uh, extend and, and amplify market power, and has not kept up with changes in our understanding of the basic economics. So today, competition and consumer protection law needs to be broadened to incorporate the realities of the 21st century and the insights of modern economics. Thank you. Thank you for those very provocative remarks, Professor Stiglitz. I'm sure we'll have more to say about many of the topics you raised. I'm pleased to in introduce now Professor William Kavasik to make an address. He, uh, professor Kavasik is professor at George Washington Uni University Law School, where he's director of the Competition Law Center. He is also a non-executive director of the UK's Competition and Markets Authority. Before joining GW Law in 1999, he was an FTC commissioner uh, actually in 2000, that should be two, uh, 2009. He was an FTC commissioner and he also served as chairman of the FTC uh, from 2008 until 2009. Uh, previously, uh, Professor Kavasik was the FTC's general counsel. Uh, Professor Kavasik. Thank you, Alden, and my, my great gratitude to my former colleagues at the FTC for the wonderful opportunity to participate in this program. Uh, the very holding of the program is part of a wonderful tradition that this agency has developed over time, and an indication of its recognition of its special institutional role in providing a foundation for thinking about the way ahead. In talking today, I'm going to give you my own views, not those of the Competition and Markets Authority in the United Kingdom, where I serve as a non-executive director. Today, I want to talk about what I think is an epidemic failure to understand the foundations of modern U.S. policy, to understand how that policy developed, and to understand what kinds of changes would be necessary in order to effectuate adjustments, a number of which I think would be quite appropriate. I'm going to talk a bit about where the consumer welfare standard came from, a bit about where some major principles that underpin substantive doctrine arose, and to talk about the need for institutional adjustments in order to facilitate changes. And in particular, I'm going to criticize what I think is a, an obsession with Chicago. That is the sense that uh, the University of Chicago, Bob Bork and others, uh, in the 60s, 70s, hijacked US antitrust policy and they haven't given it back. Uh, and to talk instead about what I think to be some of the deeper underlying sources of the system that we see today. Forty years ago, two prominent volumes about competition law appeared. 
One indeed written by Bob Bork, The Antitrust Paradox. I suspect most people in this room have read that. The other is Phil Arita's and Don, and Turner, Don Turner's first edition of their antitrust treatise called Antitrust Law. I don't know if many people in this room have read that volume. I'm going to suggest to you that that book has as much to say about where antitrust policy is today, how it developed, and how we have to think about changes in the future. Antitrust paradox is quite famous, uh, especially for its single-minded emphasis on consumer welfare, which Bob Bork basically defined in terms of allocative efficiency, perhaps approaching a total welfare standard. There's no question that that book was enormously influential widely read, widely considered. I'm going to suggest to you that it only brought along part of the profession and the community. That is, if Bork's book alone had been the only source of insight, the changes could not have occurred in the way that they did. I'm going to suggest to you that Bork was able to bring the right center right along in thinking about issues this way. But without Arita and Turner, we would have a much different system. What did Arita and Turner have to say in antitrust law? A couple of notable things. On goals in particular, they didn't speak about consumer welfare. They didn't speak about quite the same single-minded emphasis on efficiency. But they did say that competition law that does not embrace a fundamentally economic orientation and focus on microeconomic economic effects was badly misguided. They go through the egalitarian vision of competition law that appeared in the legislative history. They faithfully recite all the concerns about SMEs, about worker satisfaction, about small communities, about the protection of the democratic order. They conclude that discussion by saying, who cares? Ignore it. And why did they say ignore it? To do otherwise is to create a multi-goal framework without a weighting or hierarchy that leads you to idiosyncratic outcomes, judge by judge, agency by agency, which they described as on the border of unconstitutionality. In other words, they said the only practical way to apply this law in a coherent, meaningful way is to adopt a principally economic orientation and focus without using the specific term on consumer concerns. Not just price, quality of course, innovation, but Arita and Turner brought the center and the center left along with them. I'd suggest to you that at the time of my childhood and long after, who was the most famed lecturer in competition law? It was Phil Arita. Whose courses were the most influential? Whose articles carried thinking again and again? It was Arita and his collaboration with Don Turner. Why? Did this have so much importance? It was the emphasis on what they called administrability. That is the capacity of agencies and courts in the usual circumstance of contested facts, substantial amounts of information to reach accurate and consistent conclusions about the legitimacy of behavior. And again and again, Arita would pose the question, you have to tell the business person what she cannot do in 20 words or less. It can't be a multi-factor test that is very diffuse. In many respects, that carried into their analysis of substantive principles. It wasn't just the goals. Where are the predation defaults that Joe was talking about set more than any one place? It's in Harvard. And if you go back to the 1975 Arita and Turner paper on predatory pricing, you see the essential ingredients of the modern US approach to predation. Were they thinking in part about Chicago ideas? I suppose Philarita was notoriously ungenerous in acknowledging intellectual debts to others. He had very few footnotes that said this is where the thinking came from. But I think in many ways, the institutional perspective that they brought to bear on the topic was decisive. And their decisive influence was the standard has to be administrable, especially in a judicial system in which cases are tried before juries, generalist judges, where notions of intent, multi-factor tests are likely to lead you astray.
And yes, indeed, Arita and Turner were confronted in a famous set of proceedings that this agency convened in 1979-1980, a famous discussion of predation. I think lots of the tools Joe's been talking about were available nearly 40 years ago. Game theory, prominent in the literature, behavioral features, not so labeled, but pre-existing in a matter of concern, and one author after another attacked the Arita Turner formula and its price-cost test. And especially their observation that you take the low price today and you worry about tomorrow later on. What was Arita and Turner's answer? Are we concerned with dynamic effects? Of course. But we think they are, quote, speculative and indeterminate. And one author after another offered a basis for challenging it. But what stuck in the minds of judges in particular was the notion that the standard had to be relatively simple. Is that subject to change? In my mind on predation, have the courts, to use a regrettable American baseball analogy, have they shrunk the strike zone unacceptably? I think so. The Department of Justice and American Airlines ought not to be bounced out of court on a motion for summary judgment, where there's no jury trial and it's the government of the United States. That strike zone is too narrow. That should go to trial. That's worthy of fuller discussion. But if we ask ourselves, where did the emphasis on non-intervention standards in so many areas come from, and what we now call consumer welfare, where did that arise? It is as much Phil Arita and Don Turner as it is Bob Bork in Chicago. If you focus single-mindedly on Chicago and slaying the Chicago dragon, you don't make adjustments possible because you don't address these underlying concerns. If you want to adopt a broader goals framework, you will have to answer the challenge that these commentators offered, which says, show me how it's applied in a specific case. Show me the hierarchy of values. You want to give more emphasis to workers than you do on consumers. Consumers get lower prices, but workers get lower wages. What's the trade-off? What's the exchange rate between the efficiency that comes from scale economies and the limited opportunities for SMEs? If all you're saying is to tell the judge, you figure it out, that's an inadequate response. And I think to effectuate a change in the goal structure will require a lot of hard thinking to answer the basic question that Arita posed again and again when people would assail him on this. Tell me how it's going to work in practice. And don't just tell me that they'll sort it out in some way. So on goals. Administrability is a crucial consideration, and that view, by the way, has been adopted by many, not just those on the right, but a jurist like Steve Breyer who said one sentence from Arita and Turner is worth pages from anybody else. Steve Breyer is the perfect modern embodiment of that point of view, and if you cannot get his vote, my view was, when I had Alden's job in an earlier day, earlier day, if we couldn't get his vote, hypothetically, we had no basis going ahead. What to do about this in light of what I suggest is the Chicago obsession and the remarkable forgetfulness about Phil Arita and Don Turner. A couple of things. One, on the point of goals, in formulating a different goal structure, the administrability challenge must be met and has to be addressed head on. You don't get a richer goal structure unless you can explain the exchange rate, and explain the hierarchy of values. What gets weighted how much in what case? I'm not suggesting that it can't be done. I'd simply suggest that in modern discussions in saying, well, the view is too cramped. It's not elaborate enough. It's not faithful to the original legislative history. Footnote, Arita and Turner said, of course it's not. But the original legislative history vision can't be applied because it is not administrable, it's faintly unconstitutional. How do you beat that model? To answer that question, you have to come up with an administrable model. And I'm suggesting that there are lots of center and center left judges and observers who've taken on that view about administrability, and unless you persuade them, you have no chance of moving the needle on goals. What about doctrine? Is it just the ideology? No, it comes back to this question of administrability. 
Is it just a blind faith in the market working, the equilibrium model that Joe offered? No, it's a matter of administrability. And what element of administrability in the predation case did Arita and Turner care so much about? Private rights of action. In that famous first volume, which is a must read, they point out in stark terms that private rights, US style, are a menace. Mandatory trebling, one-way fee shifting, class actions, contingent fees. They said in the close abusive dominance case, that's going to over deter. They said, well, you can't change trebling, that's in the statute, but what can you do, judges? You can change the doctrinal threshold. You can raise the bar, and we urge you to do that because the real danger here is over deterrence, it is the false positives, so err on the side of raising the doctrinal bar. And that's what the courts do almost immediately after the publication in 1975 of the predatory pricing paper, and they've continued to do. And the predatory pricing paper foreshadowed everything including recoupment. Courts took that on. Bork criticizes that article bitterly in the antitrust paradox. He says, it's a nice idea, but the right rule is no rule. And the rule that prevails today is the Arita Turner rule, more, more than any other. Bork didn't win that argument. Much as Chicago won very few of the arguments on basic doctrinal principles, it's much closer to the Arita Turner format than anyone else. If you want to change that doctrine, you have to do one of two things, I think. And I think I'm using an MRI instead of an X-ray. I think I have a better diagnosis of what limits the system there. You have to persuade courts that the private rights are not the menace that are suggested, that is you have to amass evidence that suggests that's not the hurdle, or you have to create a government only cause of action. You have to insulate the government from the operation of doctrines that have been limited in order to preclude private trouble damage actions. That's been a problem for the government because all of these limiting doctrines spill into the government's cases. When the FTC lost Rambus, what were featured in the DC Circuit's opinions as the decisive precedents working against the commission? They were all Supreme Court decisions in which a crucial policy foundation for the Supreme Court's decision was over deterrence by private rights. They were all private cases. Footnote, when was the last time the US government was before the Supreme Court as a party? In a Section 2 case, that was 1973. All of the jurisprudence since then has taken place in the context of private cases in which the court's concerns about over deterrence are magnified. So what cases got quoted back at the FTC? They were cases like Discon, where the fear is over deterrence because of private rights. The FTC had exactly no success saying, we're the United States government. We are not seeking trouble damages here. We want an injunction, equitable relief, treat us differently, that carried exactly no weight. I'm not necessarily asking you to believe that the result that the DC Circuit wrote, achieved in Rambus was incorrect, though I think it is. I am asking you to note how striking it is that the doctrinal principles that the commission tripped up on came in cases that were founded principally upon a concern about over deterrence by private rights. So, you have to carve out a separate government-only cause of action. That could be Section 5. I think Section 5, more and more as I look at it, except for the little niche of invitations to collude, is too rigid, too fragile, and is not likely going to work. The FTC has tried to run up that hill so often, so many times. Doctrinally, it's not going to work. I would suggest an approach that prevails in the UK. That's the Competition and Markets Authority markets regime, which allows the CMA to do a study and in selected instances to achieve remedies in order to correct any competitive conditions. It's not tethered to the operation of European doctrine dealing with abusive dominance. Our system with this idea would not be tethered to existing limiting principles built in to the Sherman Act or Clayton Act jurisprudence. That is, unless you create a mechanism that gives the government freedom in a policy space to meet more judgments, and yes, they'll have to persuade critical courts that they deserve the deference, that they're doing the good homework and are creating the basis for making the judgments, but to say in that space we do deserve 
your deference, and we have a mandate that is exclusively used by us. The UK does not seek divestiture in case after case, but they carried out a magnificent restructuring of the ownership of London area airports and others as a result of this. I think a markets regime for the US that allows the government, in this case the FTC, to operate without the overhang of the limiting concerns about over deterrence by private rights is essential if Section 2 is going to work. What's the alternative? You're going to go case by case through the courts. I mean, look at Joe's agenda. Did you find that a bit breathtaking? Can you think of how many cases, rules, or other initiatives it would take to do that? That's a lot of hard work that will take a long time. Hard work that may be very much worthwhile. But behind each of those is a big case, and we know in this agency that building those cases effectively is like building an aircraft carrier. You don't turn them out in a day or a week. That will take a lot of effort. I'm suggesting that a way you can do that to go back to the courts and say, please change your mind on these issues, to slowly and gradually overcome the concerns with private rights. Or you change the framework to give the government a policy space in which it can operate, liberated from the constraints that have been imposed by the concerns with the operation of private rights of action. I'm not saying that the Supreme Court's perceptions about private rights are correct. I am saying with certainty they believe it, and it's not just the right side of the court. It's Steve Breyer, it's Ruth Ginsburg, it's a universally held suspicion. If you can't correct that, you can bring all the cases you want and you're running into a brick wall. Last thoughts, changes in institutions. If you're going to take on a broader agenda, and there are areas worth doing, I think the commission itself realizes that. I'm a little concerned in Joe's talk that there's a sense that the agencies don't think about this. Of course they do, and they work hard on these issues. But I do think the US is operating well inside the production possibilities frontier with respect to its institutional framework. And there are a number of steps that would helpfully take it out to that frontier, one I've just mentioned. I'd like a markets regime in the US. First, to do all of these things will require to take on Joe's agenda a much better program by which the public agencies set strategy and choose priorities, not in isolation, but as a collaboration. We have no equivalent to the European Union's economic competition network, which has become a very valuable device for not only coordination across the institutions, but more and more the formulation of strategy. We have no such thing. That's an embarrassment. We have nothing like the United Kingdom's United Kingdom Competition Network, which joins up regulators in sectoral areas with the, F, with the Competition and Markets Authority. We have no network of that kind, and I've seen firsthand how the ECN and the UKCN add lots of value to policy integration and enable individual public officials and institutions to achieve collectively results that they cannot accomplish. If you want to take on the bigger agenda, you will have to do more with what you have. And this kind of network governance and cooperation can do it. Better setting of priorities, better setting of strategy to map out doctrine. Let's suppose we're going to carry out Joe's agenda. What do you do first? Which cases do you want first? Which rules? This will not just happen spontaneously. That requires a degree of integration and planning that doesn't exist now. It involves looking at past successes and past failures. Is, is the current concern with concentration unique? Go back to the early 70s and look at the literature that's just scalding about the failure of the US system to deal with concentration. And the massive literature that develops in the late 50s onward, written by Don Turner and Carl Kazin, about the biggest failure of US competition policies to deal with dominance and collective dominance. The concern has been there a long time. There have been instances in which the agencies have tried to take those issues on. It's worth studying what succeeded and what failed in great detail as a way of thinking what you do next. So better priority setting, better strategy, collective effort rather than individual effort. I'd say you can't start touching this agenda in a significant way unless you get more results out of what you have. Last thought. The FTC's unique array of capabilities. About 130 competition agencies in the world today. Half of them do something more than competition law. What's the single most popular additional element? It's consumer protection. 
And when I look around the world, the question is, in theory, everybody has a nice slide deck about how they can be tied together and how they're conceptually linked. How many actually do it in practice? That's more rare. But there's a lot of room for seeing what, for example, the ACCC in Australia, the CMA in the UK, which I've seen firsthand, the New Zealand Commerce Commission, and indeed, the Competition Bureau in Canada have done. They're a lot farther ahead than their counterparts are, which have similarly situated portfolios, that is this institution, in achieving a genuine integration. I think the FTC's capacity to bring to bear its three product lines, competition, consumer protection, and privacy, backed up with a robust capability to gather data and analyze it, gives it the capacity to do special things. Historically, that capacity has been difficult to realize in practice. That won't happen by accident or spontaneously. So in thinking about the changes, in a way, I'm talking about, one, how we have to think about more than Chicago. That's a distraction in key respects. Second, we can't just think about the physics about what we'd like to do. We'd have to think about the engineering of how to get there. And great physics with bad engineering is a formula for failure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two excellent uh, addresses. Uh, makes me think of the famous uh, article uh, about two views of the cathedral by Calabresi and Melamed. So this is an unseen from different light. You have, you have two very interesting perspectives. Now we're going to go to a panel. Our first panel is the state of US antitrust law. And it will in include, and by the way, my, uh, I'll be the moderator. I'm Alden Abbott, General Counsel of the Federal Trade Commission. And 10 minute break. Okay, well I'm informed that, uh, that there's a demand for uh, an exogenous shock here, a 10 minute break. So uh, I will uh, follow uh, instructions and we will have, and to keep it to 10 minutes, because we're running a little bit behind schedules. Thank you. <laughs>
please take your seats. Please take your, is this working? Testing? Testing? Please take your seats. Thank you. We had a provocative discussion of the state of competition policy from two very different and interesting perspectives. Uh, we're going to have our first panel now on the state of U.S. antitrust law. But before introducing the speakers, uh, there will be peop, uh, interns going through the audience um, taking questions from uh, interested members of the audience. So if you have a written question, write it down on a card that's distributed to you. These will be uh, given to me and uh, time permitting and we'll try and uh, I think give at least 10 minutes for those questions. We will address some of those questions. Uh, I'm about to move immediately into panel number one. Again, I'm Alden Abbott, General Counsel, U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Uh, our second panel will feature one of the keynote speakers, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Other speakers include today uh, Dennis Carlton, who's David uh, McDaniel Keller Professor of Economics at the Blue School of Business, University of Chicago, Senior Managing Director of Compass Lexicon. Uh, Professor Carlton recently served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, and he also served on the U.S. Antitrust Modernization Commission. Uh, Eric Citron is a uh, partner at Goldstein and Russell PC. Previously, he clerked on the U.S. Supreme Court for Associate Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and uh, Elena Kagan. He has also served as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. Eleanor Fox is Walter J. Derenberg Professor of Trade Regulation at New York University School of Law. She served as a member of the International Competition Policy Advisory Committee to the Attorney General from 1997 to 2000, and as a commissioner on the National Commission for the Review of Antitrust Laws and Procedures from 1978 to 1979. Finally, Keith Hilton is William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor at Boston University and Professor of Law at Boston University School of Law. Uh, professor Hilton, uh, who is a lawyer and economist, uh, is the immediate past president of the American Law and Economics Association. We have a number of specific questions uh, which we're going to address. Uh, our session will run through 11.55 a.m., I'm informed. And uh, before turning to that, I would like to devote uh, up to 10 minutes, but no more, to reactions to the presentations by Professors Stiglitz and Professor Kovacic, uh, both provocative and wide-ranging uh, reactions. Uh, let's. Uh, Professor Carlton, your thoughts. Okay, well first, thank you very much for inviting me here. Pleasure to be here and I enjoyed listening to uh, uh, Joe and Bill, um, um, both of whom have produced um, ideas and scholarship that I greatly admire. I agree with some of what they said, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, disagree uh, with others. So let me try and explain very briefly. My main message, before making dramatic changes in antitrust, look carefully at the evidence and ask yourself what role, if any, antitrust has in explaining what is um, uh, an emerging phenomenon. Second, antitrust has proved that it can improve the process of competition. It is not well suited to fix all social problems and it's a mistake to misuse it in that way. Let me briefly talk about the evidence. Dominant piece of evidence over the last 20, 30 years is enormous technological change. Automation plus computers have displaced workers uh, who once had good jobs. That's probably the most important reason why inequality is increasing. We talk about Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon. Think back 20, 30 years to tremendous innovation that has occurred as a result of these firms. Yes, they're large. Does that mean we should break them up? Don't confuse success with 
an antitrust violation, but we should be vigilant to make sure that they don't maintain that dominance illegally. I think the antitrust laws can do that. What's the evidence on concentration that Joe talked about? I think it's way overstated, at least if you use the standard metrics, admittedly crude, in antitrust. Just to give you one example, um, although there are exceptions, um, most markets have that have seen increased concentration, they're very modest. For example, let's look at manufacturing. If you ask yourself the question, what fraction of four-digit industries in manufacturing have concentration ratios above 2,500, which we would consider highly concentrated? The answer is less than 5%. The other important feature, people who have studied increasing concentration, what do they find? There's a linkage in those industries between increasing concentration and increased productivity. That's good, not bad, not bad. Price cost margins, people have studied those recently, good topic. Joe mentioned that they, they've been rising. That literature is still in a state of flux. I'll tell you later if I'm asked uh, about what some of my, one of my students is doing in that. Let me just mention one thing. A recent paper by Bob Hall, one of the leaders um, in innovative techniques in this, in, in, in this literature from 20, 30 years ago, recently did a paper. And he shows what's happened to price cost margins. Yes, he claims they've gone up too. But what industries, he ranks them. Number one, finance. Number two, utilities. Number three, healthcare. Manufacturing, hardly at all a tra trend in price cost margins. What do you think about those three industries I just mentioned? What common characteristics do you think they have? Regulation. Third, what is antitrust? This is a central question for, for uh, government agencies. What do you think antitrust has to do with these trends? I think very little. I think technology is the main source of what's going on. Low investment, I don't think that has to do with increased concentration. It has to do with the changing nature of investment in the U.S. economy. It's been baffling macroeconomists for a while. Decline in startups, which he mentioned. You know when the decline in startups started? In the mid-1980s. It's not a recent phenomenon. It's a troubling phenomenon. We've got to get to the bottom of it. I don't think it has much to do with increased uh, uh, concentration, poverty. These are all important problems. I don't think looking to antitrust to solve them is the right thing. There was a mention briefly about merger policy, and I'm sure there will be something about John Quokka's um, uh, important recent research. But I want you to look carefully at Quokka, what he says about merger policy. The median increase he finds in his studies, which have their own problems, is 1%. That's tiny. That's not explaining these, big, these, these major trends in the economy. So let me just end by saying it's hard to respond in you know, three minutes to um, 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 uh, very well thought out uh, papers. So I want to make sure I don't get mischaracterized as saying we can ignore this evidence on increasing concentration, doesn't matter. We can ignore this evidence on the decline in business startups. We can ignore this evidence on increasing price cost margin. Not saying that at all. We need to study that and understand the um, uh, reasons for it. Uh, but I am not uh, going to, to say that antitrust is fine. There are certain things that have to be improved in antitrust in light of many recent developments, and I hope later to be able to tell you what those improvements that I would recommend uh, would be. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Carlton. Who, who would like to chime in now? Sure. I'll, I'll, do you, you want go. to go? You go okay. well, so, Professor Hilton? I'm, yes, I'll, I'll agree with uh, some of what Dennis said. Um, the concentration issue, it's both IT investment and the resulting productivity and regulation uh, that can account for um, some of what we're seeing in this area. Um, the investment is going to lead to lowering of costs, uh, an, uh, an increasing returns to scale, uh, which would give, give rise to some concentration and to some extent the ob observed monopoly, monopsony problem. Um, but Dennis has said enough about that, so I won't say much more about it. But one of the interesting features of the modern economy is something that I refer to as the kill zone problem. That, and I think uh, Professor Stiglitz touched on this briefly. And I, I, do find, I do find that troubling, frankly, and wonder uh, what can be done about that and whether it's, a, and, and I should 
it strikes me as a somewhat special problem that's arisen with platform um, markets and competition. Um, and I, I, I do see that as something that's out there that uh, I don't feel comfortable with uh, where we sit uh, at this stage. Um, but it's in the nature of, I see specific problems such as this that are connected to the modern issues coming out of antitrust. I don't really see uh, general problems out there. I think uh, most of what we're doing in antitrust is uh, defensible. Um, as far as what Bill said, uh, Bill emphasized the public-private distinction, and um, increasingly it seems the FTC itself, though, has taken steps to increase its own regulatory power, uh, such as the restitution theory that it's brought in some cases uh, for restitution uh, damages. Um, and to the extent that, that this is happening, <coughs> it would lead courts to view the FTC with the same kind of concerns that it would view private litigants with. Um, and so I think to some extent on, on Bill's own theory, um, the private-public distinction uh, would not matter very much as, as, uh, as the trend uh, within the FTC continues. That's all I'll say as, as a reaction. Okay. Um and Professor Fox. Um, thank you. Uh, those were two very, very interesting opening statements. And I want to take on two of their points of controversy and maybe a couple of additional points. So um, Professor Stieglitz says consumer welfare standard is misguided. And Professor Kovacic says Consumer welfare standard is what we have, and if we had an alternative, there would be lack of administrability. Um, and Professor Kovacic says, Chicago School is a distraction. And Professor Stiglitz says, uh, we have to recognize the, whether or not we call it Chicago, and we don't call it a geographic location, but we have to recognize uh, the part ideology, part whatever it is, has pulled antitrust action where it has no teeth and doesn't respond to monopoly problems that are becoming more urgent every day. So as to the first, consumer welfare is misguided. Of course, it can depend on what you mean by consumer welfare. And I take Professor Stiglitz to say, if you, if you have any deference for the meaning of that term, it is too narrow, that markets are the main focus, that if all you're doing is deciding that you have to see whether consumer surplus is lessened and then there's no antitrust enforcement, you have a very weak, toothless antitrust. And I actually think there's more of an agreement on that point than might come out at first glance because I see both Bill and Joe saying antitrust is about defensive markets and we have to do what we can to defend the market in a good and administrable way. I agree that consumer welfare as it is used is misguided because on the one hand it's either too big and everybody gets in under the tent and it means nothing or else it's too narrow in the way I said before. And I think that we have to move to a more robust and dynamic sense of defense of the market. And I think, in fact, that we are, and our enforcers are, in their rhetoric, they're saying now, this is good for consumers in the market, or it's bad for consumers in the market. So I think this is very important. Now, this leads me to the second point, Chicago School is is a distraction, or Chicago School is the problem. Um, I was in the Supreme Court room on the day of the argument of Brook Group, because I was one of the lawyers in the Hartford case, which followed it. And if you recall, Phil Arita argued for the plaintiff, and Bob Bork argued for the defendant, and Phil Arita had a rule on predation that was very clear, and he lost. <laughs> and Bob Borg, who didn't want any rule on predation at all, but had to go <laughs> with some rule and put in the recoupment scenario, he won. And Phil Arita pointed out in that particular case 
that the defendant had a kitty of $18 million that it set aside to try to get rid of Liggett's attempt of a new no-frills product in the market, and it basically succeeded in the end in compromising the new Lowe's Brills product. So competition was lost, dynamic innovation was lost. Philip Rita had a simple good rule and he lost. So, I mean, so my, one of my points is it is Chicago school or what we put into that term because we know what we mean. It means premises, markets work very well, government don't get in if you can help it. Um, it was Chicago school that drove that decision to be a very pro-defendant decision. Um, so maybe we do need some presumptions in the other direction. Um, and maybe it's not the case that Chicago school rhetoric is disruptive, but it shows how use of a very narrow consumer welfare standard has made the antitrust law, except US, um, and except for cartels, and except for straight horizontal mergers, U.S. has lost resonance because we're not dealing with the monopoly problems today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for a practitioner's point of view, Eric Citron, what are your thoughts? Uh, sure. I mean, the one thing I certainly agree with is that it's hard to offer any meaningful response to, su to such uh, interesting and long uh, presentations uh, in three minutes. But I guess what I would say is... Uh, Two things. One, I definitely agree with uh, Professor Kovacic's point that a lot of what we see in modern antitrust doctrine in the courts is driven by concerns about administrability and by a difference between judges who aren't really economists by training uh, and enforcers who tend to be. Um, and I think that this is a problem, you know, because uh, as Professor Stinklitz was pointing out, there is a lot more nuanced thinking available in economics than most of the judges know or are taught. And it's an interesting feature of the Philorita Treatise uh, or the Posner book or whatever you want to use as your antitrust tome, that they give you like one chapter on how to understand economics from the perspective of an introductory student, and then they teach you everything you need to know about antitrust doctrine. Uh, those simplifying assumptions are driving the, the doctrine, and we know they're false. If we were trying to land a spacecraft on the moon, we wouldn't use the assumption that uh, you know uh, it all happens in a vacuum like you do when you first learn physics. We would use complex, thoughtful, modern economic doctrine driven by what we know also about human behavior. That's, uh, that would be my second point. We have to remember that both the law and, and consumer behavior are things not that uh, perfect idealized consumers do, but that human beings do. Judges who make mistakes and don't know very much about some topics, and consumers who don't make decisions with prices and quantities or whatever. They make decisions with information, and firms can control the information and how it gets to them. Uh, we need uh, both an anti our antitrust thinking and our thinking about legal institutions to reflect uh, how human beings actually do their jobs. And I do agree, for example, with Professor Kovacic, that when you look at how judges are making decisions, they're definitely influenced by things other than the merits, like are a bunch of plaintiff's lawyers going to make a bunch of money off this case or something like that, and I don't like them. And for that reason, you may want to tweak the institutions so that we can get more trust in more complex thinking government enforcement and, uh, and less blowback from the distrust that judges have towards uh, private rights of action and the like. But the, the really important thing is that we have cutting-edge forward-thinking enforcement and not radically simplified enforcement, which I think leads to under, under action, under enforcement generally. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's, let's turn now to a number of specific questions uh, and for, for the panel. We've already heard <clears throat> a couple of mentions of the consumer welfare standard. Uh, one, I was going to start by asking, is the consumer welfare standard adequate to deal with the competitive challenges of the new economy and in assessing consumer welfare for antitrust enforcement purposes, what uh, should we be concerned about? Keith, uh, Keith, do you have something to say about that? Sure. Well, the, the question that I start with is what are the alternatives to a consumer welfare standard? Uh, I think Bill reflected on this briefly, that we, we've tried alternatives before. Um, if you go back to Judge Hand in Alcoa, uh, he 
relegated consumer welfare and efficiency to secondary status um, under the Sherman Act and uh, seemed to promote atomism as a goal of Sherman Act enforcement. Or you could go to the other extreme if you wanted to. You could say uh, complete freedom. Um, maybe that's an alternative to the consumer welfare standard. Um, I don't think there is a realistic alternative uh, to it, uh, or at least one that's worked very well um, in the case law. Um, and if you recall the Alcoa case, uh, Judge Han uh, held that Alcoa had violated Section 2 um, for preemptive capacity expansion, which is would be a, a pretty unusual theory for a court to accept today. Um, so the consumer welfare standard, I think, has, has provided a good template, a, a guideline for judges to use. It's pointed to the empirical issues that judges have to take into account in looking at antitrust cases. Um, it's certainly different from what Judge Han was using. Um, but Judge Han's standard was too ambiguous and uh, too structuralist and provided few guidelines for courts. So in the end, the, the consumer welfare standard has be, been a big improvement. Uh, I would say it's something like a foreseeable consumer welfare standard because courts are taking into account efficiency gains uh, and consumers often don't get to uh, benefit from the efficiency gains um, immediately. They don't get to eat the efficiency gains right away, but in the foreseeable future, they often do get to eat, quote unquote, eat the efficiency gains. Um, so that's what, we, that's what we have, and, and you could move away from the consumer welfare standard, but I'm not sure what you would do, uh, where, what it would be. You could try to take externalities into account, but if you're taking externalities into account as a reason to move away from the consumer welfare standard, you have to have a good sense of what those externalities are, and you have to structure then a set of rules for courts in weighing those externalities. Um, one of the issues is, is how do you, um, how do you implement the consumer welfare standard? And at least in the Section 2 area, we see two ways in which courts are implementing the consumer welfare standard. Um, one is as the balancing test, just a, a balancing of anti-competitive harms against pro-competitive benefits. That's the rough language, loose language that uh, we have as a result of the Microsoft decision. Um, and you can call that a neutral balancing test or a court's attempt to balance. Um, another approach that you see is kind of a biased approach uh, coming out of cases such as Brook Group on predatory pricing or Trenko and the link line where, uh, court, where judges are saying in a sense that as long as there's an efficiency gain, as long as there's an efficiency basis for the defendant's conduct, for the dominant firm's conduct, um, then it's okay under Section 2. There's no, not going to be an effort after that to balance anti-competitive harm against the efficiency basis. And, and the Ninth Circuit said it explicitly um, in the Allied Orthopedic case, uh, looking at a, 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 char a charge of predatory um, innovation under Section 2. So those two approaches, this sort of neutral balancing approach under the consumer welfare standard or biased balancing approach, and that seems to be uh, the biggest question in the case law, just which issues to be allocated to what sort of standard. Um, and right now what courts have done uh, seems to be a pretty sensible allocation. Um, you know, the predatory pricing area cases are in the sort of biased balancing approach, largely on the basis of error cost arguments that the court has accepted. Uh, and then there's a general default standard in Microsoft. Uh, but as time passes, courts will have to think about what kind of cases go into what kind of balancing standard uh, using the consumer welfare um, test uh, uh, the goal uh, as the backdrop. Um, so I think, I think those are the major issues. I don't, I don't see us moving away from the consumer welfare standard. I don't, I don't see a plausible alternative that's, uh, as Bill would say, administrable as well. We, we've tried it before, uh, and the other tests uh, throw up a great deal of confusion for courts. Um, and so I think, I think that's where we stand on, on that one. Eric, as a practitioner, do you see any alternative to the consumer welfare standard? Well, uh, I mean, let me say one, one thing first, and then, uh, I mean, just as an initial point, it is odd that antitrust is the one area of the law where we insist that the rule be uh, perfectly administrable and have only one overriding policy goal, 
You know, nobody thinks like U.S. tax policy has to have one policy goal and the law will not work if we try to incorporate others or anything like that. The working pure of antitrust, I'm not sure that it's necessary. I think, though, we do have a problem, which is courts have to make decisions. They need a decision rule. You can't have the decision rule be, uh, let's look at a million things. You'll make them up when you see them. Uh, the decision rule will therefore have to be, I think, the, the one we have is consumer welfare focused and probably should remain consumer welfare focused. That doesn't mean the law can't incorporate these other concerns. And it's the effort to banish the others that I disagree with. So we can be more concerned. We can be less concerned about type one or type two error, for example, uh, or we can be less concerned about false positives if this is a market where there's gonna be big informational distortions associated with missing, because this firm controls not just price, but also information about prices or information about how consumers' alternatives. Or we could be more concerned if we think there's going to be democratic uh, um, institution disruptions from the size of this firm. You know, people are scrambling right now to try to be the city which will have the highest negative tax rate for firms to locate their businesses there. That's a big distortion. The, uh, it's one that's re re relevant economically and politically. When you see size like that, you can be more concerned, but still focused fundamentally on consumer welfare. So you can move uh, the bar a little bit by incorporating other concerns. That's not to say, you know, what we're gonna have is some non-consumer welfare focused standard. That's not what we have right now. We have single-minded, obsessive focus on consumer welfare, and that tends to make antitrust enforcement in the courts very myopic. Okay, regarding, sing thanks, uh, Eric, single-minded uh, focus. What about looking at uh, additional policy concerns? We've already discussed this a bit, but such as corporate size or wealth, income uh, distribution, labor and employment considerations, other policy issues. Uh, we've heard Professor Kovacic talk about that a bit. Dennis, your thoughts? Well, um, I think antitrust is um, designed to promote the process of competition, period. It's not designed to solve important problems like that, that may well exist. It's just not suited for that. Now, if you start asking questions, well, isn't poverty an important problem? Isn't investment an important problem? Isn't unemployment an important problem? These guys are gonna merge and to achieve efficiencies. Maybe some people will lose their jobs. You start worrying about those problems, you will distort um, uh, antitrust decisions and it'll lead to uh, a lot of inefficiency, it seems to me. It's like, I have a hammer, it's good for banging a nail. It's not particularly good if I have a screw and I say to someone, put the screw in the wall and they take a hammer and they try and put the screw in the wall. It's just not gonna, going to work. And I think there's an even greater danger and that is this. If you start asking yourself what happens when you have multiple goals, and Bill touched on this, you get a lot of discretion. So judges would have a lot of discretion. Uh, um, antitrust enforcers would have a lot of discretion in which cases to bring. That seems pretty undisciplined. How are you going to tell whether someone's doing a good job if they can uh, uh, weigh a million things in, in, in their, their decision? I think it will lead to inefficiency and bad policy. Even worse, it will lead to when you have wide discretion, no one can tell, you, tell whether you're doing a good job or a bad job. That is whether you're ad adhering to, to the criteria that you're supposed to be. That puts you subject to lots of outside influence. Could be political influence, could be, God forbid, corruption, could be the uh, incentive of firms to lobby, or it could be, and, and Joe touched on this, and I agree with it, the incentive of uh, well, uh, very profitable firms to sponsor legislation that says, listen, it's not so bad, we're within this, you had this huge discretion, why don't you do this? And in fact, the FTC has, uh, uh, I know in the past, and I believe continues to do, examine proposed legislation for its economic effects at the, at the state level. What Joe is saying from his discussion, what he uh, suggested is national uh, policies can distort competition. That's a slightly different problem. Regulation can distort competition and serve special interest groups. I think the more 
you diffuse the goal of antitrust and competition policy, the more likely you open our society up to distortionary policies that will serve um, our private interests. Uh, Eleanor, uh, you have some additional thoughts? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I think that this question comes up the way it does because of what has become a very common rubric today. Either you take consumer welfare or you go down the dangerous path of public interest and populism. And I think that's a false dichotomy. So what I want to do is I want to mention three of the list of public policy concerns. And I want to show you how they're very relevant to the market working. So one, bigness. Number two, distribution. And number three, um, equitable or equitable access to markets. Um, and I am, I'm working within the market paradigm and I'm not making any argument to say that antitrust ought to be compromised by whatever value you have. So number one, on bigness, remember the wholesome Lafarge merger, this huge merger of the two biggest cement companies in the world in which um, Everybody knows that's one of the top two of the most cartels in the world. And it was cleared with lots of conditions by every authority, in, every established authority in the world, and then the developing countries just had to live with what they got. Um, why isn't it relevant that these companies have a very big track record of getting legislation to prevent in low priced imports from coming into their countries. If you check Google and, and Lafarge, you will see the companies are at this cutting edge of protectionism. And the company now becomes so huge that it's bigger than countries and its political power has to be greatly increased. All right, number two, distribution. Um, there's a very interesting question about distribution of wealth. Joe has said before, and he said now, antitrust ought to be for the people. So we have something as in American Express where one way of looking at it is if you go for the holding, this below, that this restraint that allows American Express to prevent merchants from giving a discount if they go with a cheaper card or telling them anything about a cheaper card. If you go with that is anti-competitive and presumptively ought to be enjoined, you also are going with the notion that discounts are good for people. They're especially good for poorer people and the masses of people. And is it possible that we could balance what is lower prices all over the, in the stores for people against some people getting more frequent flyer miles and even go with the presumption that firms need to take actions like bottling, gagging the discounters um, to pr protect against free riders, which as Justice Breyer pointed out, is not clear at all that there was a free rider problem. Um, uh, equal access. I want to just say a word about Cal Dental. A, a, a dentist rule that wouldn't let dentists advertise, I give you a better deal, I, I give you a big discount, so called because the dental profession had to regulate professionalism. Um, doesn't that idea, it, it's a restraint. Hard to see that it's not a serious anti-competitive restraint, although the Supreme Court so found. Um, and that the distribution would be in favor of the people who don't have money, who need access to dentists, also for dentists who need to get into the market. So there is so much room today because our law is so conservative for thinking equity issues along with efficiency issues going together, not separately. And I think that's where we ought to focus our public policy concerns. Thank you. Okay. Uh I think I'll skip by the question of industrial concentration and increase in price cost margins. It's already been alluded to. Let, let, let me uh, uh, go to a point that Bill Kovacic made about administ administrability. Uh, about uh, 35 years ago, uh, Judge and Professor Frank Easterbrook authored Limits of Antitrust, uh, 
an article which called for st structural rules and presumptions to guide antitrust analysis. Related to this is the application of decision theory, which seeks to minimize the sum of error costs and administrative costs in antitrust enforcement. Should decision theory uh, be employed by enforcers in selecting cases and in, and in evaluating specific facts? Uh, should judges apply decision theory and what are the limitations and possible problems with, it, with its application? I might mention there's an article in 2015 by Professor John Baker in Antitrust Law Journal that's a critique of decision theory. Uh, Keith, your thoughts on, on decision theory and antitrust? Sure. Um, it's been, in, it's been uh, mentioned increasingly in antitrust opinions, uh, discussion of error cost uh, rationales for decisions. Uh, Breyer has used that reasoning in a number of his opinions. Um, but it's been in antitrust for a long time when you think about it, because if you go back to the Trenton Pottery's decision on price fixing, um, supporting the per se rule against price fixing, the rationale offered in Trenton Pottery's for the per se prohibition of price fixing is mostly an error cost rationale, mostly an argument about well, we could use a more fine-grained, granular rule, but we're likely to have a lot of mistakes, uh, and those mistakes are going to be re really costly. So it's better to have a per se prohibition. Uh, so antitrust has been uh, taking advantage of error cost decision theoretic arguments for quite some time. Um, so in a sense, they, they, um, it would be, I think, um, not very productive to try to avoid or um, you know, sort of uh, push down or, or get away from these error cost arguments. They're gonna, you're you're going to find your they're, they will find their way back into the doctrine because court because courts are going to realize that the standards are difficult to apply. You, judges can make mistakes, um, and you've got to have a, a, a sense in the background. What are the costs of these mistakes? What are we What are we messing up if we make mistakes, and how bad is that? So the Trenton Pottery's rule is based on a, a, an assessment of the costs of these mistakes. Uh, the Brook Group predatory pricing standard is based on the same kind of rationale. Seems to me we've got we've got error cost rules that are weighing in favor of plaintiffs, in favor of defendants in this field, um, and they're going to be part of the field. It, it's it's going to be part of the doctrine because judges are, and it's it's it to me it's a wonderful thing that antitrust doctrine has developed to allow courts to make these uh, sensible judgments, which would be unlikely to come out of a legislative process. Um, so no, so I, I'm actually uh, quite favorable toward them. Are, are they perfect? I'm sure you can find mistakes. I'm sure there are areas where you'd like to see the uh, uh, air cost framework uh, t uh, maybe change slightly in some way. Uh, but for the most part, um, we are, uh, I think the courts have taken uh, the right approach. And I, I can offer some suggestions myself of where I think the error cost framework could, uh, could be uh, changed a little bit to make specific changes, um, specific improvements. Uh, but for the most part, I don't see it as controversial. I think it's been there in antitrust for a long time since the Trenton Pottery's decision. Uh, it's now sort of brought out into the surface and judges are openly embracing, embracing the uh, thought process and talking about it openly. Can I? Sure. Yes, please. Uh, so, I'm mean, implicitly, uh, people are always uh, are are making judgments uh, uh, with priors and with uh, judgments about the consequences of one type of error uh, or another. Uh, what worries me a little bit is the uh, uh, persistent uh, mistakes in the uh, judgments about mistakes, uh, which I think has been uh, part of the concern um, in. Uh, and there are two uh, 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 points I make. First is um, when hysteresis effects are important, uh, then making uh, a mistake that you allow market power uh, to increase, where you don't prosecute, can have, will not be self-corrected. We know, we know that, that markets are not self-correcting. So the agglomeration of market power uh, is going to be persistent. Uh, I think the error of uh, uh, saying a particular merger, uh, say, shouldn't go through, the cost of that, you know, given 
if you believe that the economies of scale and scope are relatively small, the cost of that is relatively small. And uh, if there are um, uh, real economies of scale and scope, then that error will be self-corrected uh, in the future because some other firm is going to, or that firm, and some other way of getting the advantages of those uh, scale and scope economies will occur. So the point is, we know that there is, in a sense, one direction. And I don't think the court has, uh, court has at least a lot of the decisions, has, has not balanced uh, that uh, correctly, not taken into account uh, the importance of hysteresis effects. The second uh, point I make is, is that the magnitude of those costs depend on partly uh, our legal framework. If we had a framework where we could go back and revisit uh, uh, these issues, uh, if we could say, okay, you said that there wasn't going to be any agglomeration of market power, you weren't going to raise price, but five years later, we'll go back and revisit that, then that would put these errors in a different perspective. So if we change our legal framework, what gave us more authority to go back, if they say, oh, don't worry about these anti-competitive effects, we are really not a predatory uh, pricing, we're, we're really going to keep those prices low, and then you see three months later, they act exa exactly the opposite, then you could go back and revisit. I feel very differently, uh, and so uh, the nature of your judgments of those errors has to be put in the context of what are the remedies if you make an error. And can I just follow up? Sure, on? Eric. The, uh, you know, I agree with what you're saying. Like asking whether decision theory th should be incorporated in legal rulemaking is like asking whether we should try to get the rule right or wrong. <laughs> of course, we should incorporate anything that leads to more accurate legal decision making. The question is, is the organizing assumption of something like the limits of antitrust true or false? The organizing assumption is, if we make a mistake that is under-regulating, uh, it's okay. Markets correct themselves. If we over-regulate, that's the only source of durable market distortion. Uh, th if that premise is true, great, but I don't think it is true. We should probably analyze it uh, using our modern economic tools to figure out if it's right or wrong. Uh, and. We should be, and it, on the ground for lawyers, what you see is just decision creep, right? Uh, what this uh, critique uh, from Judge Easterbrook makes the most sense in is per se rules that might be way over broad, per se rule against vertical price restraint or something like that. Um, but n at the American Express oral argument, you have uh, Justice Gorsuch asking, well, shouldn't we just not do anything in this case because of what Judge Easterbrook wrote in 1984. Uh, and this is a rule of reason case where a district court has made a bunch of findings about the effect of the rule at issue. Um, the organizing assumption needs to be one that is uh, accurate if you're gonna incorporate decision theory in this way. If what we're trying to say is, should we have a rule that we just favor under enforcement for its own sake, uh, you know, can't possibly agree with that. Okay, in interesting. Uh, so I think, um, let me, so we're hearing different views on, on presumptions. So let me move forward and raise a new issue, um, actually an FTC specific issue. FTC Commissioner Chopra has proposed that the commission consider adopting competition rules through a notice and comment rulemaking process. Uh, is this a good idea, and what about strengths and weaknesses? Dennis? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you about exactly um, uh, the, the legal implications of rulemaking, um, but especially in antitrust, uh, having a rule strikes me as uh, undesirable, especially after we just heard what Joe said about how the nuances of economic thinking uh, and the economic circumstances influence um, the ultimate decision. Uh, if you have rules, then you have a lack of flexibility to adapt the rule to the particular situation. You know, maybe that's okay for consumer protection. Maybe you want to have a, a, a different thinking about that. But at least for antitrust, it makes me nervous. Um, uh, but having said that, um, what I am in favor of, and I think um, 
the Commission's paper uh, would endorse this, um, is that the FTC should be doing, and the DOJ too, studies of important policy questions in order to inform us of sort of the general findings that can influence how judges and state legislatures and, you know, maybe even uh, Congress uh, view certain practices. Um, and that is related to the last question. It, it's all about, you know, your projections of how long will market power last uh, if I make a mistake? How uh, long will an inefficiency last if I don't allow a, a, a merger? Those are empirical questions. Those uh, presumptions don't need to have anything to do with that. If you have the empirical evidence in an industry, there's never been entry. So uh, why do I expect entry to solve a problem? Mm -hmm. um, so let me just give you three examples. The FTC did studies of hospital mergers and I think had a big effect on showing um, the world or the US uh, people in the United States who are interested that sometimes hospital mergers can be bad. You shouldn't just say they're fine. Um, the FTC has a program where they go around, uh, I think they still have such a program they did when I was in the government, um, in which they go around and they warn states to about the harms from certain uh, legislation that they're considering. For example, licensing. Licensing in the US has gone up from something like 5% of the workforce to 30% of the workforce. They create an entry, um, an entry barrier. And let me say one other important issue, um, merger retrospectives. Um, very important to do, but a merger retrospective is not asking, ah, there was this merger, did price go up? That's important. But what you want to be thinking about if you're a decision maker is, can you, the researcher, tell me something before I have to make a decision that'll help me make a future decision, th that'll improve my decision making? Everybody has 20-20 hindsight. You can't say, oh, that was a good merger, that's a bad one, you made a mistake there. As a policymaker, I want to say, look, that, that's interesting information, but what did I do wrong? What should, I have been done di what should I have done differently? And if the researcher says, beats the hell out of me, I wouldn't say that's particularly helpful research. So let me give you a research program. Uh, the research program is economists, when studying mergers, have uh, merger simulation models, for example. When you look at a merger, and you assess whether to allow it to go through, what did your model say? Now, let me compare that to what actually happened. I want to know when the models work, when they don't. That's not been done in a systematic way. That's something the FTC and DOJ could do, could try to do. When I was at the Department of Justice, I made this suggestion. I would say it went over like a lead balloon. But uh, I, I, would, I would suggest that there are studies the FTC can do that can inform us on important policy matters for which perhaps our priors are wrong and we sh those should be corrected and that's a very important function of uh, the FTC and DOJ uh, to, um, to engage in. Uh, thanks. Uh, Keith, do you have thoughts on competition rules? Sure, it's an, it's an old problem. The question, should an agent, agency engage in rulemaking or adjudication? And it's sort of across this is a problem that's been across several agencies. The NLRB, uh, National Labor Relations Board, for a long time that's been a, a, an issue. Should the NLRB, uh, you know, uh, generate new rules through adjudication, through deciding labor disputes, or through rulemaking? And for the most part, uh, it's worked through adjudication, and I think that's been a good thing, um, largely because some of the points that Dennis touched on, that they involve intricate, tough problems. You need to hear from people with real stakes on those issues. What they you need to hear what they know about it and what the source of the problem is. Um, and the same thing is true in, in antitrust. I mean, so my point is that the NLRB process has actually produced better law as a result of adjudication than I think the agency could have produced through rulemaking. I think the same thing is true of the FTC. I think adjudication uh, as the common law process generally has an advantage over it a rulemaking process or a civil law process because of the information that litigants bring before the judge, private information that otherwise you can't get a hold of. Or if you try to get it, you'll get it from lobbyists who uh, will try to distort the decision maker's um, preferences. Um, 
adjudication has the, has the benefit that people are revealing important information, private information about what's at stake, and, and, and they're honest about it. They're not just trying to push uh, some program. Uh, or if they're pu pushing a program, it's clear what they're doing. It's not, it's not hidden in any way. Um, so the adjudication question is, is like the question, common law versus civil law. Plenty of important benefits come out of the common law process. Uh, in fact, you know, Judge Posner kind of made a uh, career off of uh, talking for a while about the benefits of the common law process, the efficiencies created by the common law. Not to say that, that rulemaking uh, can, uh, not to say that rulemaking can never be good. Sometimes there's an important uh, big change, institutional change, and that sometimes you can only get that through a rule. But generally, that's um, that's probably not the best way to go for uh, an agency or some tribunal that has to make fine-grained decisions on the scope of a right and sort of vary that scope depending on the interests on both sides of that question, uh, which can vary a great deal depending on the nature of the dispute and the nature of the parties. Uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz, you have thoughts on possible competition rules? Yeah, well, first, I, I think the way Keith put it is right, that there is always going to be a mixture between rulemaking and uh, adjudication. Uh, but I think we, are, we don't have the right balance right now. And this actually, in a way, interacts with the earlier question uh, about administrability. Uh, a rule of law is a statement that you know with some degree of predictability what kinds of actions are legal and, and not. Um, there are some cases where you can write down a rule. I don't think there's any problem saying that uh, uh, some of the fraudulent, uh, you know, it, 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 if you misrepresent what you do, if you're engaged in fraud, that should be illegal. I mean, you can say subtlety. Well, uh, it was, uh, uh, there might be some circumstances in which uh, uh, freedom of speech is important. I have the right to lie as part of my freedom of speech. Well, okay, but as a, as a business practice, uh, you should outlaw it, and you could come back and say, make some defense, but it's, it's a rebut rebuttable presumptions. And it seems to me that there, we could write down rules that say if you have a very large market share and you engage in uh, a vertical merger in those, those cases, or you engage in particular kinds of restraints that we could write down, the presumption will be very strongly that that's anti-competitive. And, uh, you know, that goes back in, in some ways to um, the issues uh, uh, Dennis talked about, the importance of preserving uh, the process of competition. Uh, if uh, you have uh, clear uh, cases of monopsony, where consumers might benefit because some of those benefits of monopsony power are passed on to consumers, you will say, no, that's still interfering with the dynamics of competition. So having rules that make it clear what is admissible and what's not, and there's always going to be things that are outside of the boundary of the law, uh, rules, and that, those are the things that you're going to have to adjudicate. So even in, in common law countries, you have adjudication. So it's the balance, and I think we haven't gotten the balance right. Interesting. Now, let's go now from some broad uh, conceptions to a, to a specific case, which has already been alluded to by a couple of people, the Amex case. A few months ago, the S Supreme Court held five to four that a lower court erred in uh, uh, failing to apply a two-sided market definition in evaluating so-called anti-steering agreements between American Express and merchants accepted its credit, accepting its credit card. The anti-steering agreements basically prevented the merchants from revealing that another uh, card, uh, that other cards might offer uh, certain advantages to consumers. Uh, now, this raises several questions. Now, let's... Uh, First of all, this two-sided market definition, although there's been a lot of research on the concept of two-sided markets, where you have a sort of an equi equilibrator of a platform, uh, say a publisher or, or a restaurant uh, owner who's dealing with uh, 
two different sets of, of transactors, newspapers, say, dealing with uh, uh, custom, you know, consumers and advertisers and so forth. The idea of a two-sided market definition has been discussed by economists at some length, but was a novelty in, just, in judicial decisions, as pointed out uh, in a dissent by Justice Breyer. Um, well, will this holding have a significant effect in the high tech platform and other markets? In particular, the concern raised about durable monopoly, say, by the big digital platforms, the Googles, Facebooks, uh, and so forth. W would, is this sort of decision, does it make it harder to submit to uh, apply antitrust scrutiny to the activities of, those, of the big platforms? Uh, and if so, is that problematic? And l let me uh, ask Eric. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say too much about Amex lest my head explode here, but I will say, you know, you have a situation where uh, you have uh, enforcement agencies from both parties, you know, d uh, active during both parties, uh, both political parties' uh, occupation of the administration and uh, a huge number of the most respected antitrust scholars and economists saying uh, that the rule that Amex is seeking is incorrect. And then you get the court saying the rule that Amex is seeking is correct. Uh, and it, that's a problem. It, it is inaccurate antitrust enforcement. And the question is what you do about that afterwards. The court says we're not really going to do a two-sided market definition all, of, all the time. We recognize that we do it one side at a time in the newspaper space. We're not overruling that decision or anything like that. This is something special about American Express. <laughs> now what happens is a contested point, and it's for antitrust enforcement agencies and for thinkers in antitrust to relentlessly criticize the Supreme Court for making this mistake. And that's okay. You, you can say, look, we recognize that case came out that way, it shouldn't go any further than that because it is not correct. Uh, so I don't know what the consequences of the decision will be, but they should be narrow. Uh, the court was only able to write a very narrow opinion, uh, and it's really up, but it's really up to thinkers in this room and at the agencies to say, look, uh, there are sometimes two-sided market definition might make sense, like in the predatory pricing realm, but when you're asking questions about restraints of trade and market power in a particular relationship, like can a crowd company get merchants to do what it wants or not, you don't really need another part of the market to know whether or not there's power in that relationship. That's what every antitrust uh, law professor would have told you, and there's no reason for the <coughs> agencies to abandon that view just because the Supreme Court has uh, come out a different way in one particular case. Uh, Dennis, do you agree? Uh, yes, uh, I should add I've worked against the credit card companies for many years, both here in the United States <laughs> and around the world. Um, so I have a paper that's coming out with Ralph Winter in the Journal of Law and Economics and explains why rules like those in American Express uh, can harm competition. Uh, the no steering rule was basically that a merchant can't when a customer is checking out, tell them, hey, why don't you use this, this card? It's also the case that American Express doesn't, uh, rules don't allow a merchant to surcharge an American Express card if uh, it's a more expensive card for him to, to use. Now, the court relied on saying it's a two-sided market. It's much different than one-sided markets. We know one-sided markets when there's promotion. We know how to handle it. I'll, I'll let you read my paper with Winter, but we show that, there's no basis for that. You can actually show that rewards to the card consumer can be treated exactly as promotional effort uh, in one-sided markets and you get the same conditions. I thought Breyer's dissent was exactly right in bringing out the criticisms. So my own view is that having different rules for one-sided versus two-sided markets, so that three-part test and who has the burden, um, and that just strikes me as um, based on a faulty economic uh, logic. The court is very unclear how it would define a two-sided market. I think it's going to make it harder for plaintiffs to win. Uh, 
um, uh, cases when the defendant can say he's a two-sided market, and given the vagueness of the definition of two-sided markets in that court's decision, I guarantee you everybody's going to say who gets sued. <laughs> I'm a two-sided market, you know. I'll I'm hire a six-sided market. Right. So I, I, I think um, it, it could um, uh, impair uh, the administration of the antitrust laws to preserve the process of uh, competition. I hope Eric is right that uh, it's so narrowly interpreted to, ex to, to apply only to cards that are green uh, or whatever uh, that doesn't apply to anything else, but I'm worried. Um, and I should add, it's part of a, these no steering rules appear in many different guises. Joe mentioned this, and I agree with him. And I've opposed rules in these other guises where a platform, there, there are restrictions that one platform places on someone who's um, selling, for example, products on their website that says you can't sell at a different price anywhere else. We've got to examine those rules. I'm not saying they're always bad but they raise difficult problems about competition, and those are going to be increasingly important in these plat as platforms continue to, to grow um, because of the Internet. I just want, uh, I, I don't yeah. I just want to say, because it's really close, I think, to the mission of what we're talking about here. I mean, Dennis and I don't agree about a, a lot of things, uh, but you know, the agreement that you have there, it's an opportunity to say, okay, what can we do about it when the court makes a mistake? We were talking about the agency's rulemaking authority. They don't have to let courts that aren't necessarily experts in the realm be the last word. You can publish papers and do other uh, sort of soft power things at the agencies, try to continue to move the law in the right direction, try to show judges where they've made mistakes, and you can use the rulemaking authority of the agency to try to address areas where the decision rule in the courts doesn't end up being the correct rule. Can, so, can, Joe Stiglitz. I just want to say, I very strongly agree with Eric, and this is really an illustration of what we were talking about earlier, the scope for rulemaking by the, F, by the FTC. And, and, and it's, a, it's a really good example where you can step in and, and make a difference. Yeah. Okay, let's move to uh, a very hot area that's generated a fair amount of uh, literature in recent years. Uh, inter interplay between intellectual property laws and antitrust laws. Uh, does, in general, does antitrust do an adequate job at considering innovation incentives when evaluating IP agreements? And I've got a number of follow-on questions. Okay. And certainly, uh, as you know, there's been a lot of discussion about so-called yeah. standard essential patents and refusals to license or restrictive licensing terms as standard essential patent holders and as to whether those should be subject to antitrust scrutiny. But let, let me start on the very general level as to whether antitrust does an adequate job in, in policing uh, uh, agreements, uh, licensing and related agreements involving intellectual property and in particular patents. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dennis again. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of complicated issues associated with the intersection of IP and antitrust. Uh, part of it has to do with the adequacy of the granting of patents. If you are over granting patents, creating patents that are, have a high probability of being invalid, you're, you're just creating problems. And in a sense, the antitrust laws are there to try and fix things as best they can. But the right way to fix things is to really go after um, uh, the intellectual property laws. Um, in terms of, um, say, standard essential patents, uh, and it seems, it always, and I, I have several papers on this, it always seemed to me that the issue with standard essential patents is that a standard setting organization, an institution, is existing to allow collaborative, collaborative efforts to create a standard that supposedly is going to benefit everybody. And the person, people involved sign a contractual commitment saying, I'll charge you something that's reasonable. <laughs> and then they never say what that means. It's reasonable and non-discriminatory. And then if you wind up in the courts, everybody's definition of reasonable is, uh, you know, it depends on which side of the bargain you are. Uh, it seems to me the institutions 
the standard setting institutions should play a greater role in trying to resolve those issues. <coughs> um, I would suggest that standard setting organizations pay much more attention. I know they don't, they don't like to get involved because they're fearful of triggering antitrust violations on their own part, and they want to leave that out of their bailiwick of responsibility. But it seems to me if you're the responsible institution to allow collaborative effort, you should be also responsible for the consequences of that collaborative effort. And if it leads to someone saying, well, that, 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 that standard essential patent is exercising market power, and the only reason it's exercising that market power is because you let him be in the standard, and he's violating the contractual commitment, it seems to me the, the institution should, should try and resolve that. I think it's a very hard problem for courts to resolve. Uh, my experience is it's a, a big mess. Um, um, uh, when you have to litigate, and I think compelling arbitration uh, through a standard setting organization itself would be a superior resolution. There's no easy answer to this question. Well, Eric, uh, anything to add on that point? I've been talking a lot, so I won't say very much. I mostly agree with Dennis. The only thing I would add is that we have to have continued vigilance to make sure that standard setting organizations mostly do standard setting and don't do price fixing. And it's various kinds of alternatives, which is like you have to do business this way under the guise of a, a privacy you know, regulation or a security regulation or something like that. The, the test should be pretty relentless. Was this, a nece was this necessary to secure an efficiency or is this unnecessary collaboration between competitors? And this is just an area where I think courts are becoming not vigilant enough and the agencies have to maintain their vigilance. On a somewhat different aspect of IP antitrust, do you think antitrust is doing an adequate job in, in dealing with uh, assessing mergers and, and contracts in high technology sectors and in particular digital platforms, say, per, say if a, a dominant digital platform acquires the intellectual property of a small startup firm, that sort of thing. Anyone want to comment on that? Maybe I mentioned the kill zone problem yeah. earlier. Maybe I'll come back to that. The, so the kill zone pro problem has been out there for a long time where uh, startups are afraid that, uh, well, you know, it's, it's Microsoft and their platform, the desktop, uh, a startup wants to create some software that could be on the Microsoft desktop and Microsoft comes to them and says, um, hey, we'll buy you out for $1 or we'll just do it ourselves. And um, so, you, you know, you sell out to Microsoft for $1 in that case. Um, and of course, once people are aware of that problem, no one wants to innovate in the platform space. Um, so that, that strikes me as a as a as a problem. I I, I don't know uh, I don't know what antitrust can do about it at this stage. And it seems to me it's an empirical issue whether this is um, having on net uh, a negative social welfare impact. I'd like to see what the studies show. And people are doing empirical work on this question right right now. Um, but maybe it needs some, if there is a problem, maybe it needs some specific kind of scalpel-like solution. You know, maybe it's closer to one of these unusual cases like salvage contracts in the high seas where, you know, courts say, <coughs> courts say we're not going to enforce, you know, we're going to put an arbitration process over this. Um, because the problem with the kill zones is that the platform um, owner always has the threat, the credible threat to say, well, if you don't sell out to us for one dollar, we'll just do it ourselves, and you'll ne you'll never see any money out of that venture. Um, so maybe there's some way that we could structure the arrangements so that the <coughs> credible threat can't be made to an innovator uh, on the platform to to get around the kill zone problem. I see that as sort of a an example of one of these specific problems generated by platform markets and mergers in platform markets that antitrust hasn't solved, or at least we're not sure that the antitrust solution, which is, I guess, not to do anything, um, is the right solution. Um, and, uh, and since I'm reluctant to intervene in, in markets, I'd like to see what the studies show on this. But if they show something, maybe that's an area where there's a tweak that, that needs to be made. Interesting. Let, let me, uh, yes, please. Um, I, I think there is a problem in this area 
And I agree with everything that Keith said. And just to take it a step further, or maybe a step back, actually, um, I think that many authorities uh, who passed favorably on Facebook's acquisition of Instagram are sorry they did, yeah. that they did not think hard enough that these two companies um, that did not look like direct competitors actually were in the same future competitive space. And I think as a result of that, I think there's going to be more care, and I think there definitely should be more care, so that the dominant platforms don't swallow up the new entrants that could be challengers. Could I just say one thing? Yes, um, Dennis. I kind of agree with uh, a bit with both those. Um, as Keith points out, the, it's an empirical question. If you don't allow the dominant firm to buy um, the people with the great new ideas, and they may be better generators than the, the giant firm, uh, there could be a harm because those ideas, um, you might not have an incentive to create those ideas. That's, that's the, the hard problem. Uh, so that's why you need an empirical study. But there's another problem. And uh, I'm not sure, although I, I partially agree with what Eleanor said about you know, potential competition, I want to just put a finer point on it. When, if I produce product A and Eric produces product B and we say we're not in the same market, uh, let us you know, uh, merge, um, that sounds right. But let's suppose we both use data sets and have different data sets. Well, maybe it's not product A and B that's important. It's the merger of those data sets. And when you say future competition, I can't even predict what that, those two data sets are going to be combined, are going to be used for. So maybe there's another market we hadn't paid enough attention mm -hmm. to, namely the market for, for the use of data. And do we want to allow combinations of data? Maybe it's efficient, maybe it's not, I don't know. But I might be worried that that is creating monopoly power in something I hadn't thought about before. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Let, before, I have a number of audience questions. No wants to. But Go ahead, yes, please. Oh, I just, and that's uh, one area, by the way, where the, uh, FTC's consumer protection interact and privacy concerns interact with an antitrust. And uh, those combinations of, of data give, uh, can, can be a very big barrier to entry for other firms. It is a uh, tool for, as I suggested, for extracting consumer surplus and producer surplus, so having negative social value in, in, engaged in, in distribution. And uh, it's related to you know what I I said. You you have to make judgments about what the future uh, effects on the dynamic process of competition. Now, uh, so I really agree with what everybody said except one qualification. I'm not sure that doing studies uh, uh, of what's happened in the past is going to be very dispositive about a particular example like Instagram, uh, I think you're going to have to use judgment uh, on that. And uh, those are area, areas where we'll, we'll make mistakes. But when you have a platform that is already dominant, I think one ought to be particularly wary. And, and so that's sort of the frame of mind that one ought to go into, that uh, uh, almost surely you're not uh, the, at least as I make a judgment, that the anti-competitive effects, the effects on undermining dynamic process of competition, are, are the, that risk overwhelms the possibility that some idea, and if you look at some of these ideas, like having pictures sent over electronically, that's not, you know, that's not a breathtaking idea, and, and somebody will invent it maybe a week later, but the world will survive. <laughs> That's a safe view. Okay, uh, we've talked about the, the big data briefly. What about the implications of uh, data protection and privacy, typically viewed as consumer protection problems? Should, since it's consumer protection looks at those issues, should antitrust also try to uh, assess them in particular cases? Uh, that who would care to comment? Say, er Eric? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just would, um, when it comes to big data, privacy, 
Uh, and, and other, I think, related areas of consumer protection. I, I like uh, what Professor Fox was saying earlier about thinking about consumer welfare by also thinking about the health of markets, right? You know, um, uh, if data is going to allow, you know, if ownership over a very large set of data, consumer data, is going to allow firms to distort the markets in which they operate, that's a problem. It's a competition problem in addition to a consumer protection problem. If a lack of price transparency in how you uh, deal with your consumers or contract transparency in how you deal with your consumers uh, allows you to distort the market in which you operate, that is both a competition problem and a consumer protection problem. And I think we should be thinking about data concerns particularly in that way because I think data is an important barrier to entry in uh, a lot of new technology markets and spaces, and those markets are unhealthy because of very large agglomerations of data in some hands and its inability to reach others. Uh, Eleanor, any thoughts? Um, right, so I agree, I agree with Eric. Um, Bill Kavasik made the point earlier and, and Joe endorsed it that this is a really good area for the Federal Trade Commission to combine its expertise in antitrust consumer protection, um, bringing in data privacy. Uh, Europe is way ahead of us. I'm thinking about these issues. I think we have to think more seriously about them here. Um, I think we have to think more seriously about an issue that I know many would not like to, but um, it is a big platform that has a lot of power that is both the gatekeeper and is one of the people on the platform always preferring itself. And in addition, as the European Commission is just investigating right now, um, whether Amazon is taking all the data, being both a customer and a platform, and whether it's taking all this great data that it's getting and preempting the next new big idea that you can discern from analyzing all that data. Very complicated question. I'm not signaling that I know an answer, but I think that there are problems, clearly problems of unfairness, where there may not be an inefficiency in catching the problem. And Europe, I think the Commission will think that way. Um, and I think that it's a test that we ought to put ourselves to also. First, to see, is there real, a market obstruction? Does it lessen innovation? But second, I would be all for also saying, uh, well, if you can't quite put it into antitrust, is it a problem of preferring your own that is so unfair and inequitable to the people using your platform when you are both the gatekeeper and one of the people on the platform? Could I just add? Dennis, yes. There, there are really, I think, two, two additional points I'd like to make. The first is this issue about data, although I agree it's both a privacy issue and an antitrust issue, uh, there is an overlap, no question. Um, the key issue in data is property rights, and that's what you have to ask. Who has the property right in the data? If I am on a platform selling my goods on Amazon, does the Amazon have the right to my property as to who my customers are? That's a property issue. That should be defined. <laughs> okay. and so we have different laws in the United States. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I have a general understanding that um, uh, I have a property right in my health care data. Do I have a property right in my search engine data? Well, I think we should ask questions. What does the individual or a firm <coughs> have in terms of property rights in its data? That's one question. Second, we've only talked, or I only talked about sort of merges, when you're merging data sets. And that's not the only antitrust concern you want to be concerned about. If I'm a dominant firm and I'm using a third party, a third party website is relying on me for something, and Alden's my competitor, and I say to that third party website, you want to deal with me? You better not give Alden any data. That strikes me as something we should be concerned about. So those are new antitrust issues that are going to arise more and more, I think. And um, I do think antitrust has the tools to deal with it. I don't think antitrust had necessarily has the tools to deal with who has property rights and data. That might be outside antitrust, but I think it's important to define property rights 
uh, correctly. Otherwise, uh, we will get an inefficient outcome. Yep. Alden, both Joe and I. Will, yes. Maybe I'll yield to Joe first. Oh, well, um, the the uh, even after we assign property rights, there is a consumer protection issue because uh, firms may induce people to sell that property right at a price because they don't really know the value of that property. So that that's actually poses, I think, a really challenging uh, question uh, for the FTC about whether wh what what is the transparency in the in the transaction and and uh, uh, the since the sum of the values of by combining property, uh, the value of the data to the individual may be very little, but when you combine it with other data, it becomes very valuable. And that was the first point. The second point is uh, this misuse of data that's generated another way is a problem that, that uh, is confronted in other uh, areas. For instance, um, in uh, uh, some of the uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, as a, as a, when it was processing um, transactions, uh, a standard thing is front running, and uh, that's Ill illegal. But one of the things that happened in the in in, in the flash trading was uh, we allowed uh, them to engage in that until we stopped that, and that really distorted the market. That was a real a good example where where the use of data, as when you were in a, in a, in a multiple roles, uh, gave you an advantage over the people who you were supposed to be uh, be serving. And it distorted the market because um, through this, what is effectively front running, it took away all the incentives for other people to gather uh, information because the value of that information was being uh, appropriated. Finally, let me just mention that, uh, uh, Eleanor mentioned that other countries, Europe in particular, is ahead of us. For instance, some of the European countries just don't allow you to combine data sets. And they're, they're, you know, so you, you, there's a restriction that has a efficiency loss, you might say, but the uh, be competitive benefits may well outweigh the um, deficiency losses, and the efficiency gains in most areas are probably very little. They're just allowing people to exploit you, exploit you a little bit more. So I'll, I'll, I just want to say one thing, Alden, I'll, I'll be quiet, um, that the property rights issue, that I think Dennis is entirely right that it's a property rights issue, and to some extent underneath there is a market structure issue, because if we had competition among platforms, I think property rights would develop naturally. So for, for, so for example, uh, you know, Bing, I guess, has a bidding system already. They offer rewards, I guess, or something if people search on Bing, but I don't think anyone takes advantage of it. Um, but to the extent that you had competition among platforms, a platform would be forced by competition to protect privacy, to protect property rights, but we don't have that. And so as a result, the dominant platforms can just abuse the users. Um, and so the ideal solution would be competition, it would be other multiple data brokers and uh, platforms. We don't have that now, and so we've got to worry about uh, you know, the property rights issue uh, and what can be done about it uh, for now. I have a few audience questions. Let me very quickly ask the, the important issue. Joe Stiglitz hit, discussed briefly vertical mergers and, and, and a new uh, learning. And is, are the enforcers doing an inadequate job in assessing vertical mergers and perhaps more broadly vertical restraints? Any, anybody else on the panel want to comment on that? Well, I won't say anything about vertical mergers um, <laughs> because of the AT&T case that I was involved in uh, that's under appeal right now, but I will say something about vertical restraints. Uh, vertical restraints of the form that I mentioned, similar in, to those in the American Express case, in which the vertical restraint is what I call a vertical most favored nations clause, in which one manufacturer says to a retailer or a platform, I don't want you to price my product any higher than um, my rivals, or there's some condition in which you're um, in, um, telling the retailer how to price relative to your competitor. I think those raise uh, subtle, uh, uh, or maybe not so subtle issues <laughs> that hadn't been uh, well thought through. And it's a very simple example. So let's suppose Eric and I are two manufacturers, and here's the retailer, 
and um, we have a most favored nations clause, a clause just like we said. If I raise, if I lower my price, Alden can't lower the retail price. If I lower the re his, my wholesale price to him, he can't lower the retail price. Therefore, I'm not going to get a whole bunch of customers over. So I don't have a real incentive to lower my price. What about if I raise my price? If I raise my price, I don't have to worry that my retail price at Alden's store is going to be higher than Eric's, and then I'm going to lose customers. So it creates an incentive for both of us, instead of to compete by dropping our wholesale price, to compete by raising our wholesale prices together. It eliminates competition. It's a striking phenomenon, very simple to understand, and I think hasn't received enough attention. Anyone else? The only thing I would say about vertical mergers, and I think it might be true of what we sometimes call conglomerate mergers too, is that we just aren't thinking creatively enough about potential competition. It's a really big issue. It's a really big problem. It's, the Instagram, Facebook example is one particularly good one. It, it strikes me, you know, nobody thought Netflix was going to be a content maker. Everyone thought Netflix was going to be a distribution company. It turns out it's now a big content company. Uh, that's because uh, access to capital is important. Access to markets is important. Access to expertise is important. And a lot of vertical mergers are adjacent companies that could be expanding into those spaces vertically on their own uh, and generating new competition, and instead they don't. It's a merger between potential competitors that we don't see because we're so focused on what the companies do right now. I think that's something we should worry a lot harder about, both in the vertical space and in the conglomerate space. Okay. Eleanor? Um, yes, I think we do need clarification on vertical mergers and vertical agreements, and I agree with both what Dennis and Eric said. I would love to see vertical guidelines. I think we ought to have them. I think there's going to be so much kind of philosophical dissension of trying to get to an agreement of vertical guidelines that I'm not predicting that they will happen in the end, but I think it's a very important exercise to go through and see if agreement can be reached. Can't I, hurt to try. Yeah, can't hurt to try. I also think in the vertical space that we haven't given enough attention to leveraging problems uh, because it often is the case that you have um, one firm that is functionally related in two markets and can discriminate against those that are not its own firm. And I think that this can create problems. It doesn't always, but it certainly can create real competition problems. Okay. Uh, Keith, before we turn to our audience questions, do you have anything to add on Burger? Uh, no, I mean, not much. I, you know, AT&T, Time Warner, I mean, that seems to be largely a question about evidence and a case, uh, you know, based on evidence and proof. Um, and the litigants seem to have um, a lot of opportunities to make arguments about anti-competitive effects, which in the arguments were put out there. Um, and, uh, you know, the trial court judge just uh, thought the evidence weighed in favor of the merging parties. Uh, so I don't see a big problem here. I mean, I, and I don't see how you're going to, uh, how antitrust can do anything about the evidence and proof issues. That's not really an antitrust matter. That's a, a, an issue of how, how a judge weighs the burdens and weighs the evidence that's produced under those burdens, which, which is everything uh, that, from what I could see, AT&T, uh, Time Warner involved. Uh, I don't see an antitrust issue there. Oh, so could I just add one more? Sure. Is there possibly a question that for so many years in the past, uh, well, since 1980, there's been this very strong assumption that if it's vertical, it's got to be good and it's got to be efficient. Uh, Joe, you raised this in your initial presentation. Maybe we should rethink that. Yeah, and, and particularly uh, when you have uh, uh, a oligopolistic markets. Mm. Uh, you know, if this these were all very competitive markets, I think our uh, our, our attitudes would be very different, and we, we would say there are probably some efficiency gains or something else going on. But we, when you're doing this in an oligopolistic market, it's very easy to show that those vertical mergers do result in less competition. And not only in the dynamic way and the potential competition, but actually, Maybe. if you write down a model, any model of a Nash equilibrium, uh, a game theoretic model, uh, it is very clear that that uh, will happen. And the problem, as I saw it in the AT&T case, is that they 
uh, the judge didn't understand the analytic framework. It wasn't the evidence. It was actually the analytic framework through which he could interpret the evidence. And that's always going to be a problem because we have mental models through which we have to process the data, the evidence that we have. And the mental model that's in the minds of a lot of judges is the wrong mental model. Okay, we're, we're running short at about seven more minutes. Here are a few audience questions. We haven't talked about antitrust immunities, but one question for Professor Fox, others can chime in. Could antitrust and competition law have something to say about lobbying by large firms in light of the issue of economic power translating into political power through lobbying or other forms of influencing our lawmakers, uh, which contributes to maintaining market power? So the issue of, of uh, anti-competitive activity through lobbying, of course, there's a there's the uh, petitioning uh, antitrust exception doctrine, but in general, are, are these issues worthy of additional thought and analysis? Professor Fox? Right, thank you. So I would say two things. One is Noor Pennington, which um, provides what looks like a really robust defense um, that allows lobbying and puts it outside of antitrust violation is too broad a defense. And the Federal Trade Commission has been doing good work on this point over the years with Tim Muras, for example, doing really great work in trying to narrow the exemption. And I certainly support the Federal Trade Commission in trying to narrow the exemption. Um, there's no good, in my view, there's no good reason to allow the competitors to get together to lobby. If you want to keep the channels open, you can allow individuals to come before um, the decision maker, governmental decision maker. Um, all right, so the second is the other place, which I mentioned earlier, it fit into an existing competition problem. It wasn't its own problem of just saying lobbying is uh, anti-competitive. And that is where I'd mentioned it in Wholesome Lafarge, that I thought it was really uh, an emerger that looked so anti-competitive and also so huge, I thought it was a good idea to take the whole picture into account, which included an awful lot of lobbying against cheap imports coming in. Yeah, I just think we have to recognize one reason why big can be bad is because big leads to rent-seeking behavior at governments, and we can't address that directly because the First Amendment is a bar to it. Uh, we just have, we have to be aware of that, the way that power can be used at government to get what you want. And it seems to me, unless it violates some law, which I have no idea if it does, that a responsibility of economists, especially at DOJ and FTC, is if they see protectionist legislation being proposed, they should say so. Yes. And I understand that may have political risks and may even be illegal. I don't know if DOJ and FTC can do that. But um, if they can't, they should be able to. Yeah, I, just let me add, the, the, the analytics of what are the effects of various regulations should be within your remit. I mean, sure. and, and, uh, and the way in which uh, a whole set of rules and regulations affect bargaining power in oligopolistic markets, markets with imperfect competition, w would be an important contribution to try to bring that out. Okay, let me... Uh ask one more question, you know, to what extent, if any, and this is probably primarily uh, for Professor Fox, but others should ch ch chime in, uh, to what extent, if any, should U.S. policymakers and antitrust enforcers look to the EU for guidance on competition issues? And I, w I would go beyond the e EU to additional agencies, such as, as mentioned by Professor Kovacic, uh, uh, the U.K., uh, Canada, perhaps, Australia. Are, are there specific things that they are doing now that perhaps we should consider adopting? Um, okay, so I'll start out on that. I think the United States does not look enough at our counterparts all over the world and even within our own country. And I think uh, Bill was entirely right to bring up the UK experience and the market inquiries experience as a great tool. Um, as for EU, it's a little complicated because EU does uh, sometimes lean a bit far in um, imposing duties on firms, but we lean a bit too little 
in imposing duties on dominant firms. And I think that there's a lot that we can pick up by watching the EU, but with, um, with some skepticism, but re with some receptivity. And we ought to realize that we're out of step with the world in imposing so few restraints on our dominant firms. Okay, uh, we've got three minutes left. Uh, let's have very quickly closing thoughts. Let me go back to Professor Stiglitz. Uh, well, thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, begin by picking up on something that Eleanor just said, which is that uh, because we don't uh, uh, take as active policies on antitrust and competition, it may have macroeconomic effects. While we all deal with individual cases, cumulatively, when you don't deal with them sector by sector, it winds up in leading to a less competitive uh, <coughs> economy, and, and that has macroeconomic uh, uh, consequences. The second observation I want to make that we haven't been able to talk about, which is uh, the strategic question, uh, which is um, some of this, uh, I think, may be able to be done through uh, uh, case by case. Some of it can be done by FTC rulemaking. I think some of this will have to be done eventually by Congress. Uh, and I think there will have to be a judgment, you know, have we gone down, have the course gone down in a particular direction so far that to reverse it will take another 20, 25 years because of the nature of dynamics, you know, the damage that will be done in that 20, 25 years could be very large. So I think that one of the issues that I think our society needs to confront is uh, how much can we do within the existing legal framework and how much do we, where do we begin to start saying we have to redefine the law? Okay, uh, Keith Hilton. Sure, um, I guess I'd, uh, I'd begin with the statement that in general, I think antitrust uh, is in pretty good shape. I mean, the, the platform markets are generating new problems and their questions, the, the data privacy issue, the kill zone problem that we've talked about that antitrust doesn't seem to have a solution for right now. And, it, and we need to do some research to figure out the extent to which the problem requires something, um, requires a solution. Um, as far as the rulemaking adjudication uh, divide uh, or going to Congress, I, you know, my inclination is to prefer the adjudication approach that we've taken uh, and rulemaking where it's codification of principles that have come out of adjudication that are pretty well established or where there's a, where, where there's a need for a big change. I would be wary of seeing the FTC shift toward rulemaking as a general matter wary of Congress, too, because the Sherman Act, uh, if you've uh, read the statute, it's pretty sparse. Uh, section 1 and Section 2 are just two paragraphs. And could you imagine Congress producing a statute like that today? No way. Nope. Uh, it would go to 2,000 pages, and it would have little exceptions in there for this company and for that company. Uh, there's no way Congress would produce a competition law statute today that would be as useful as the Sherman Act is now, because the Sherman Act has been left to largely judges to figure out how to do it, and they've done it case by case, and they've generated uh, very useful rules out of that approach. Um, so I, I think I think the I think we I think our framework is largely sound, uh, though the platform markets, the new economy has generated some problems that uh, we still need to look at more carefully and try to figure out what how to solve these things. Uh, we technically have run out of time, but if anybody wants to add anything very quickly. Oh, can yeah. I add quickly? Eleanor. Um, because I'm sorry, I have to disagree. I do not think antitrust is in very good shape. <laughs> and I think that the problem is, and with apologies to you, Bill, the problem is Chicago School and the philosophy that's carried it way off the mark. So I just want to say two words about, I mean, this is Bob Potowski's book. Um, and it was 10 years ago, how the Chicago School overshot the mark, the effect of conservative economic analysis on US antitrust. It's not Republican Democrat, it's a large span of really important scholars. Everybody should read it again. Uh, and this was 10 years ago, 
The Chicago School of Philosophy keeps even way more overshooting the mark as shown in American Express. And what we've got to do is we need a new center of gravity. And I want to invoke sort of the legacy of Bob Potofsky. Um, think Bob Potofsky, read his work again, read his opinions, maybe combine with Justice Breyer, because, and Justice Breyer often cites Bob Potofsky, um, Cal Dent, Legion, American Express. Um, Breyer gives, uh, uh, tries to get back to the mark with clearer rules that respect the forces of competition more than we respect the competition, forces of competition today. And read the Second Circuit opinion in Trinco, which was the law, and in my view was correct, before the Supreme Court in Trinco, because the Supreme Court in Trinco changed a huge amount, and the Federal Trade Commission, with Section 5, in my view, um, can take up the slack. I would just say very, very quickly, uh, a lot of the things I've said today I think are things that the agencies already do better, already think about, uh, and the courts don't or are missing. And when that's the situation, all I can encourage the agencies to do is to keep pushing. And if you have to go to court and lose, lose out loud so that we can go to Congress and say this is a problem, or you can go to judges and say this is a problem, it's something that we have to change going forward. Because if you lose quietly, we have a situation where we continue to overshoot the mark in the same direction in, among judges who don't really recognize that the scientific, economic, policy consensus is against them. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, five things I would recommend. Don't misuse antitrust by trying to fix problems that antitrust enforcement is not well suited to fix and has little to do with their creation. Second, I'm against rulemaking in general, but I do favor studies of policy areas to enlighten us about our prior beliefs about what works and what doesn't. Do retrospective studies of economic models to tell us which ones work, which don't. As far as whether antitrust is up to the task of dealing with new problems, I think it is, but there are new problems. Pay more attention to data and how control of it can affect competition. View attempts by dominant firms to deprive rivals of data in a harsh way. Pay more attention to what I call the vertical most favored nations clauses. They can be sometimes justified, but we've not paid enough attention to them. And finally, both agencies should evaluate the competitive consequences of existing and proposed state and federal um, laws. Thank you. Thank you. That ends our panel. We have a 10-minute break. Be back 10 minutes sharp. That would be 10 minutes after 12. Thanks. I took some different